this is the sixth of the literary activism uh, symposiums. Um, we started in 2004, December, 14 December. Um, I, I, I hope you can hear what I'm saying. Um, and um, you can now visit the literary activism website, which came into being in August 2000, uh, August last year, 2020. Um, to, to get a sense of the background to this project, uh, to, to these um, to these symposia. Um, it was uh, the symposiums were created in order to create a space for discussion about the creative process, about literature, the arts, whatever that might comprise, um, cinema, um, art, um, also translation, publishing to also the sciences, something which is doesn't fall into, into this kind of, um, the domain of the creative process uh, according to convention, but uh, is part of the cultural sphere, especially for scientists, uh, two of whom we've had in the past who are both writers or creative writers and scientists. Um, the aim was to create a mix of people at these interactions. Um, who would then be speaking about a theme and to each other um, in a way that reflected um, the urgency or immediacy of their thoughts about what it meant or means to be a practitioner um, at this point of time. Um, and this, I'm sorry, the other category I should have included uh, is the academic or the professor, or the teacher. Um, so it, it seems that the world had kind of bifurcated in many ways. So over here to simplify things, uh, maybe oversimplify them, but, uh, um, but it's still a, a, a kind of, uh, um, persuasive for me, uh, dichotomy um, for the writer bifurcated into um, the literary festival, uh, uh, for literature it had bifurcated into the literary festival and academic conferences. So the academic conferences, uh, conference was a place where uh, literature would be talked about uh, within the parameters of um, the, uh, the, the academic paper, um, uh, professionalized uh, interchange, uh, often theme-based uh, by a group of scholars who observed uh, what might be called uh, in a slightly cliched, ugly phrase, scholarly protocols. Uh, uh, a, a professionalized uh, setting where uh, professional proprieties were meant to be observed. Uh, one of the, the main sort of markers of, of, of observing professional propriety, I think also had to do with the fact that the, the, the voice of the academic was a neutral one or is a neutral one. It's not an I, the, the I doesn't really generally speaking come in. The I coming in is problematic and unprofessional, if not de-professionalized. Um, and then on the other hand, there is the I playing itself out in a different way in the realm of the, of the literary festival where uh, books are talked about, writers are talked about, literatures are talked about, but in connection to the latest book being published by that particular author. So there, there is the connection of of the plug, the pitch for the book, which has just come out. 
So uh, the question was uh, how to talk about things which were urgent to oneself as a writer or, or filmmaker or publisher or translator in a field that since the 90s, early 90s was dominated by the market uh, and a, a domination which um, academia doesn't, didn't seem to be taking uh, cognizance of, uh, busy as it was with other things to do with uh, dismantling the ideological uh, presuppositions of the literary. Um, how then to talk about uh, what it meant to write beyond beyond talking about your latest book, what time of the day you woke up to write, whether you wrote on the laptop or with a, with a ballpoint pen, how, how to go beyond that particular narrative? And how, how would academics go beyond uh, their, their largely sort of, you know, um, themselves, uh, I mean, a discourse which referred to each other as they spoke about, a, 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 and their, each other's scholarly work as they spoke about a particular subject or theme, how, how, to, how to get beyond that into what was happening today. So uh, it was to, to distance itself from the literary festival and from, um, from the professionalized academic setting that this, this space was created as a, a, one of the participants uh, called it in a fringe academic space. I think that's a good way of putting it, a fringe academic space. This is a fringe academic space. We take advantage of the fact that this might be borne out by counting the number of people, academics in the audience today uh, uh, from Ashoka, uh, where, where, the, where the kind of faculty is not com completely aware that this is happening. Um, so um, it's important that this fringe academic uh, space exists and that it's lucky for us that Ashoka is hospitable to this space. A lot has been happening in Ashoka University in the last week. And um, it's important that we all, including the people who set up Ashoka University, learn from this experience as I think they want to. Uh, otherwise, uh, basic intellectual freedoms on which um, conventional pedagogy, uh, including things which I'm, this literary activism uh, symposium is distancing itself from like the academic conference, uh, the, uh, the intellectual freedoms that those things, the classroom and conferences are dependent on not to speak of the intellectual freedoms that we rely on as a given when something like this happen, happens, uh, that, that those aren't threatened by factors which have existed in India, exist in somewhere everywhere now, but exist in India for decades now. But right now is far more focused, those factors are more, more focused on um, creating a, a climate of distrust and intimidation. Um, so, if you're in the business, sorry, I don't, I'm using that word metaphorically, of education and uh, thinking, then one has to start out by realizing that this is a given and that one will have to deal with it, resist it, sidestep it in order to even exist. Because otherwise, not even the simplest form of teaching can exist. So um, having said that, we will now proceed with this particular symposium, which happens to be on decolonization, uh, a theme which arises from my experience of things that were happening in the UK and observing what was going on in the US in the last not just the last year or the last couple of years, but before then too, long before then, 
but those 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 kind of um, developments uh, have an impact on, on all of us and they have their echoes over here as well uh, which which one can devote another symposium to in the in the future in terms of what what constricts knowledge um, what directs uh, attempts to direct uh, control and determine it so um, without uh, saying anything more i'll hand it over to the chair my colleague at the university of east anglia uh, john cook who has kindly agreed to chair this and the next session and who has had something to do with the symposium from its inception um <laughs> thank you amit <clears throat> and uh it's a great pleasure to be taking part in this. I think this is the, is it the sixth um, international symposium <clears throat> in the series that you've organized. Um, and it's a pleasure too to introduce um, Aditya Chakraborty um, this evening. Um, like many people um, and many other people, I expect that one of the main reasons I go to the Guardian uh, website is to read uh, Aditya Chakraborty. Um, and there are many reasons for, for, for doing that. Uh, one is because I'll always learn something about, um, in the case of the United Kingdom, the nuances of political debate or the, um, the implications of particular kinds of policies. That's to say, um, I read what he writes for information uh, and for uh, a better understanding through acquiring information. Um, but I also read him for other reasons. I, I read him uh, because of the uh, wit uh, and the incisiveness um, of his style. Um, I read him uh, because um, he uh, writes at a distance from the uh, trading of pompous cliches, which passes for political conversation um, uh, much of the time in the United Kingdom. And um, if you want an example of his wit and incisiveness at work, I recommend a very interesting piece that he published recently um, on the cult uh, that's growing up at the moment around the conservative politician uh, Rishi Sunak. Um, the other thing I think, uh, the other reason that I, I read his work is because of the fact uh, that I'm reading not simply an informed voice and uh, a, a witty and incisive uh, commentator, uh, but I'm also reading somebody with a commitment and uh, that commitment is to social justice. Uh, that commitment is to um, understanding the way um, in which um, the behavior of those that are politically powerful uh, can have all sorts of consequences, uh, most of them not good uh, for those who are not uh, powerful. Uh, that commitment in, in his work remains unswerving, it seems to me, and admirable. Um, He's won a number of awards for his work, um, including in 2017, the British Journalism Award uh, for uh, a Comment Journalism of the Year. And um, he's now working on his first book, which is going to be published this year, I think, by Penguin Alan Lane. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce him to you uh, tonight. And uh, the subject of his talk is, Before I Was Asian, I Was Black. Uh, personal reflections on this moment in anti-racist politics. And just to underscore a point that um, has, I think, already been made, if you want to um, ask questions um, after Ad uh, Aditya has finished uh, speaking, then please can you post them through the Q&A function um, on, the, on the website. So Aditya, over to you. John, thank you very much indeed uh, for that introduction. That's very, very generous of you indeed. Thank you. Um, before I begin on my talk, I just want to say I was invited to do this by Amit, uh, for which I'm very much obliged. Uh, I have been um, very concerned by the news this week from Ashoka University. Um, I can't pretend to know the facts of what's happened, uh, all the nuances and details, but 
we do expect our universities to defend free speech, free thought, no matter how uncongenial to political masters, to corporate donors, to prevailing fashions. Um, that, it seems to me, is part of what a university is for. Um, anyway, my talk. Uh, this is called Before I Was Asian, I Was Black. Before I was Asian, I was black. No, I have not undergone some miraculous change in pigmentation, such as enjoyed by Michael Jackson. I have not doused myself in fair and lovely. I'm talking instead about how my family and others used to describe ourselves. I grew up in 1980s London, where the streets still echo to the anti-Nazi League's chant of we are black, we are white, together we are dynamite. My mother was a primary school teacher and belonged to her trade union's Black Caucus, which claimed to speak for all teachers who face racism. My father, likewise, would congregate with colleagues from other parts of the Commonwealth, and they would all answer to the rough descriptor, Black Lawyer. How far off that all now seems. Even now, for me to hear a phrase such as Black Caucus is, be, is to be transported back to chants of Maggie, 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 out, 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 of skinheads in bother boots telling us to go back where we came from, in rather less polite terms, um, of the first ever West Indian origin politicians getting elected to the House of Commons. That was only in 1987, as recent and as distant as life before email. It was an, in, it was an era in which the aforementioned Maggie Thatcher the most electorally successful prime minister of the last century, described the UK as being swamped by people of a different culture. At this point, London was no capital of global finance, but was instead a city of dying factories and residents decamping to the countryside, to Europe, to Australia. The use of that particular use of the term black had long since faded by the mid nineties when I left home for university. Although even there, I was handed a copy of the Black Prospectus for Black Students, published by, I believe, another Black Caucus. Among the highlights of the brochure were action shots of a Gujarati boy pointing at a college notice board. That sadly turned out to be a fair reflection of the entertainment on offer. Today, the very idea of someone of my ethnicity referring to themselves as black seems a joke. What I miss about that is not so much the term, but the politics it embodied. It was born of a recognition among those who'd recently arrived in the UK that they faced obstacles in common and would try and beat them together. One wore black, not instead of Jamaican or Sikh, but as well as those other labels of cultural and historical identity as a badge of anti-racist affiliation. And more besides, it was a movement that wouldn't settle for diversity, it demanded equality. Not merely representation, but transformation. The two things are not imposed, are, are not opposed, but in both cases, the first stops far short of the other. And the disappearance of that term, of that idea of political blackness, tells you a lot about what's gone wrong in race politics since. Now, this is, I know, a highly inconvenient time to making any such argument, especially in the UK. Why talk of losses when everyone else is totting up gains? When you cannot turn on the television, it seems to me, without seeing an advert for some supermarket or other featuring a, a black family tucking into that week's groceries. When every glossy magazine, the kind that sells cars and shoes, most articles about how white people can be better allies to their black friends. For a quarter of a century, race has been pretty much absent from black politics, yet today it's plastered all over our newspaper front pages and the subject of debate in Westminster, even apparently Buckingham Palace. There's much to celebrate here, not least the energy and inventiveness of the activists involved. A couple of weeks ago, in response to Meghan Markle's complaints about the tabloid's treatment of her as a mixed race woman, the Society of Editors released a statement that said, the UK media has a proud record of calling out racism. Now, 
This is the same UK media that I'm just going to show you um, an example. Bring this up. Okay. I wonder, I'm trying to bring up my, just a, a couple of pictures. Okay. Ah. No, I've not, I'm not managing to do that. Um, it's the same UK media that regularly publishes front pages about how immigrants bring in disease and where the biggest selling tabloid ran a cartoon at the turn of the century which showed um, men in uh, kutas marching across the border with rats following them. Within a few hours, a letter denouncing the statement had been signed by over 200 journalists of colour, of whom, full disclosure, I was one. Can you see me? Yeah. Right. The Society runs one of the UK's major journalism awards, which is soon coming up. The Black Host of the event withdrew. Journalists and news organisations announced they would boycott the ceremony. Within days, the head of the society was out on his ear. It is quite possible the entire organisation will be broken up. Let me underline. These are the most powerful people in the British newspaper industry, media executives whose whims and prejudices keep prime ministers up at night. And here they are, made a laughing stock by a bunch of youngish activists, ethnic minority journalists and others, on their lunch breaks, and a few people on the internet. This is the origin story for a number of today's political protests. A legitimate grievance with a clear focal point is given the caffeinated jolt of social media and suddenly there is chaos. Perhaps, one hopes, productive chaos. Now, what's wrong with that picture? Well, let's pull the camera back a little. Amid all the uproar on planet Megan, my mind went to another story. In 2011, just before another royal wedding, that of Prince William to Kate, I wrote a piece about the people who cleaned Buckingham Palace. There were about two dozen of them in one trade union, mainly black African, and they were treated a little better than the dirt they cleaned. The staff were too frightened to talk publicly for fear of retribution, so in print I invented names. There was a guy I called Anthony to get from his one bedroom bed to get from his one room bedsit to the palace of 52 royal bedrooms and 78 bathrooms was a journey of one and a half hours. When he got to work, men and women shared one room in which they had to change. They were asked to leave their coats in a storage room full of cleaning fluids so that at the end of a shift, the coats reeked of chemicals. Stinking, exhausted, humiliated, Anthony would sit on his bus home among the tourists and school children. His wages for cleaning the London home of the Queen were just above the legal minimum. He'd wanted to go to college, but the royal pay was so low, he was working another job and getting by on three hours sleep a night. While chatting, I idly picked up his paperback, a fantasy novel with a dragon on the front, it was the sort of thing you meant to romp through in a few hours and forget about after minutes. Except Anthony had been lugging it around for months. He could never read more than a few pages at a time, he told me. Otherwise, my eyes start to burn. That's what happens, I suppose, when you never get enough rest. My piece made me the only journalist to write about the struggle of Anthony and his workmates and my newspaper, the only broadsheet to mention their poor treatment. This is not a boast, it's an indictment. What are we saying here? That racism only matters when it hurts a royal? That a cause lives or dies by whether it enjoys the oxygen of celebrity? Or that linking race and class is now dead politics? I don't really know the answer. I do know this. On any given night in London before this pandemic, there were thousands of people like Anthony cleaning offices, serving security guards, washing up in the kitchens of restaurants and pubs, 
minding the sick and the elderly in care homes. Nearly all of these jobs will be low paid, the vast majority insecure, a significant number involve outright bad treatment. And the men, more often women working them, will almost all be from ethnic minorities. What is any social movement for racial equality today that doesn't have them at its heart? So here's a paradox. On the one hand, we have a media, especially a social media, that's collapsed the distance between us and celebrities such as Meghan Markle, or between us and those protesting in America the death of George Floyd. Our imagined communities now stretch further than we could ever have dreamt. Yet the result is often a politics that's narrower. The cry of the late 60s, early 70s used to be that the personal is political. Today, it seems that for any social movement to take off, the political must be personal. People must feel able to read themselves into the struggle to find their own biographies within it. When it comes to race politics in the UK, this dovetails with an older trend of the state funding groups, not on what they do, but on who they claim to represent. Whitehall, Whitehall has doled out money to the Muslim Council of Britain in the name of preventing terrorism. The writer Arun Kandani charts how Bradford City Council encouraged and funded local mosques to group together and provide an alternative voice for Muslims in the area. The hope was that they would become allies in the processes of absorbing opposition at the expense of the younger militants. It goes without saying that the younger militants were aggressively secular. This is just one example of how the state and then the media have shifted respectively money and focus from progressive anti-racist politics to older conservative ethnic politicians, from activists to self-proclaimed community leaders. Now let's see how these two forces work together. Today you're, not, today you're either black or you're Asian. A categorical wall has been erect, erected and other divisions are hurriedly been thrown up. He is a Bangladeshi Muslim from Whitechapel. She is a Nigerian Christian, Christian from Lewisham. They get different fundings from their different London councils. They watch different television, they eat different food, they go to different places of worship, they mobilise around different causes. Never mind that they, they may both be working the same dead-end jobs, that they've both been knocked about by the same school system, that they now face the same struggle to find an affordable place to live and will face similar obstacles in advancing through the jobs market or even in dealing with the police. Never mind that both are far more likely to be struck down by COVID or to die as a result. The emphasis is upon ring fencing identities and celebrating the differences. What gets lost in the result? Well, for one, the long, stubborn, delightful, complex history of migrant politics in the UK, and anyone who cannot marshal a strong enough political or media presence. Two examples from just the past month. A woman from East London called Shamima Begum, who as a teenager left for Syria to marry an ISIS fighter, was finally stripped of her British citizenship on the grounds that she could apply for a Bangladeshi passport. She cannot come back here, even to face trial. No matter that Dhaka has already said it will give her no such passport. At the age of 21, she is effectively stranded. Public outrage? None. Also this month, it was revealed that a large company running holiday parks called Pontins had circulated a memo banning travellers from booking. Managers drew up a blacklist, including specific names such as Carney, Boylan, McGuinness. It was decorated with a wizard holding a wand and declaring, you shall not pass. As blatant example of discrimination, uh, as I've seen for a long time, and of course, the government dutifully condemned it. But outrage or even significant media coverage for the travellers themselves and the, the prejudices they face? None. Yet the travellers are, are perhaps the most bullied minority group in the UK. Again, What's the lesson from this? That bullying is fine as long as it's not us that are the victims? Because I don't think that there is, I really don't think there is a minority group in the UK is badly bullied as the travellers. 
And so the politics of anti-racism risk being supplanted by the politics of ethnic representation. Now, the first can encompass the second, but in the end, they are two different politics with two very different trajectories. The first is a cause, the second is an interest group. The first questions connections between power and knowledge. The second can be a tool for the powerful, for the tick box classes. Consider the current uproar at Leicester University, where managers are trying to get rid of lecturers in Chaucer and Beowulf in the name of decolonizing the curriculum. In this case, decolonizing is no more than an alibi for the management, which also wants to lay off management studies academics for being too critical of modern managers. But ask yourself this question. If a political movement, a social movement, can be so readily exploited in this fashion, then what kind of movement is it? What kind of politics does it embody? Notice also how much the right enjoys this course, this discourse since it enables them to deny that there is any such thing as racial inequality per se. Instead, there are left behind areas and disadvantaged groups. And wouldn't you know, among the most left behind of all are the white working class. How many times have we heard that phrase in the wake of Brexit and Donald Trump? And what an interesting phrase it is, white working class. Three words in which it's really only the first that matters. And even if you don't mind any of that, even if you argue that we shouldn't hold ourselves to impossibly high standards because conservatism never bothers with any cause beyond defending its own interests, then let's also admit that these new identities are utterly jer jerry built. I began by mentioning my mother who passed away last April. Today is actually her birthday, the first for which she will not be here. She was a primary teacher in inner London in that period when it was less well known for its fantastical house prices than its violent crime. To visit her staff room was to go on a whistle stop tour of the British Empire to see teachers from Trinidad, Nigeria, India, Pakistan, Cyprus, Ireland. All, I think, first generation immigrants to the UK, all women. And all aware that those two things in combination meant that they were not paid what they deserved and would likely be passed over for promotions. Now, today, my mother would be classed as Asian and one of her best friends, Lynette, black, even though Lynette was a Trinidadian Hindu who came with us to Pudja. Another friend, Dorothy, was from Ireland. Today, she might just about be termed BAME, an acronym for black and minority ethnic that hardly anyone seriously uses to describe themselves because it sounds like pure census speak. And yet my father would talk to Dorothy about Charles Stuart Parnell and Eamon de Valera and all the other Irish politicians he learned about during a boyhood in Bengal in a house where they studied Ireland's struggle for independence for clues to their own destiny. This is a very different model of culture exchange to the one left us by rigid identities engaged in their own competition about who has suffered most a kind of oppression Olympics. On one hand, you have heterogeneity and complexity. On the other, homogeneity and simplicity. Perhaps it seems strange to use such words of race politics, but what it most often reminds me of is the way that people now consume culture. A couple of years ago, Harper's Magazine in America published a much discussed essay by the critic Christopher Lawrenson on how the internet had affected book reviewing and the discourse around literature. Lorenzen had been the literary critic at New York magazine, but had lost his job when it decided criticism, indeed challenge of all sorts, was less marketable than author profiles, the kind of thing that Amit talked about at the beginning. Lorenzen's piece is a kind of frontal assault on the algorithm and the feed. Literary discourse, he writes, now, mimics the grammar of social media, the likable, the shareable, the trending, the quantifiable, the bite size. What we increasingly want out of culture and out of politics is a mirror and an echo. The great shadow of influence hanging over Lorentzen's piece was another article, this one four decades old. In 1980, the New Yorker magazine devoted most of its issue 
to uh, most of one of its issues to an essay by one of its staff writers, W.S. Trow. Called The Context of No Context, it was a strange incantatory piece preceding by aphorism and vignette. It was later published as a book and is now passed around as a kind of samizdat criticism of modern culture. Trow's subject was television and what it had done to the culture that he knew. Like Lorenzen, Trow could see right in front of him the erosion of his authority. Although as an East Coast wasp, he was altogether less self-pitying and rather more ambivalent about his entitlement to it. As a study in the transition of power, how power is shared out, how much is kept back, who defines the terms of transfer, it is exemplary. Last summer, as cities across America rose up in outrage at the police murder of George Floyd, the New Yorker once again published an essay on the passing of power. It was by its theatre critic, Hilton Owls. He wrote, at meetings and parties, one spends a great deal of time with people I call the collaborators. Functionaries in service to power who will step on your neck to get to the next fashionable Negro who can explain just what is happening and why. When white America asks black artists in particular to speak about race, it's almost always from the vantage point of its being a sort of condition or plight. And if those collaborators can actually listen, what they really want to hear is, who are we in relation to you? Then Owls did something really interesting. He cited Trow's essay from 40 years earlier and quoted at length an important passage, which I want to read now. Trow writes, during the 1960s, a young black man in a university cl the class described the Dutch painters of the 17th century as belonging to the white students in the room and not to him. This idea was seized upon by white members of the class. They acknowledged that they were at one with Rembrandt. They acknowledged their dominance. They offered to discuss at any length their inherited power to oppress. It was thought at the time that reactions of this type had to do with white guilt or white masochism. No, no, it was white euphoria. Many, many white children of that day felt the power of their inheritance for the first time in the act of rejecting it. And they insisted on rejecting it so that they might continue to feel the power of that connection. Had the young black man asked, who is this man to you? The pleasure they felt would have vanished in embarrassment and resentment. In Owls's hands, in the setting of his essay, that passage changed meaning. It was no longer a cry of despair at how little is known. Instead, it became an indictment at how America's hard ethnic categories, now being imported into the UK, allowed those in power to, consent, to condescend to those without, even when they themselves understood so little about their own culture. And I'll suggest that black people allow that to happen by not challenging those categories. I want to conclude with one last reference to my mother. When she arrived in this country in the late 60s, she came armed. She had read Shakespeare, Hardy, Hazlitt. She'd been taught by a student of Harold Lasky. Few people she met in London knew who he was, even though he ranked as one of the LSE's most interesting political theorists. As for the poetry, the golden treasury, forget it. Blank English faces from here to Highgate. Never mind. My mother had never read any of those people to qualify to live here or to learn how to fit in, any more than she'd taken up Tolstoy with a view to moving to the Russian countryside. It was the world's culture. It was her culture. And like her, I see no reason to fit inside any pigeonhole unless I make it myself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adita. That was a, that was a fascinating talk. Um, fascinating talk. Um, I'm get oh good. Sorry, I was just getting some echo back then. Um, 
So, uh, Aditya, I, do you have time to take a few questions or responses to, to what you've just said? Um, yes, very much so, yeah. Good. Um, can, can I start by just um, trying to uh, probe a bit further the, um, well, the, the contours of the loss that you're describing and, and what it's caused? Um, it, I mean, for example, if I could just raise the, go back to the case of the United Kingdom and the atmosphere that you describe in the 1980s. Um, was a, a, an important component in that um, solidarity that you described the fact that there was still an active trade unionism? Um, <clears throat> that's a... That's a really good point. Trade, the trade union's role in uh, anti-racism, um, informing identities around race, is a highly troubled one. Um, oftentimes you had uh, black and Asian workers who struggled for representation within their own trade unions. Um, in one particular very famous case, um, there were East African Asian women working in a photo processing plant uh, in West London called Grunwick, uh, who uh, went on strike and found that their strike uh, was not fully supported by the trade union movement. There were a few breakaway trade unionists like Arthur Scargill, who came out and stood on the picket line with them, but actually they had none of the, the wider support of the trade union movement. Um, and so part of the story, the 80s and 90s, and, and in fact, it goes on now, it goes on now, John, um, is trade unions struggling to, to, to accommodate and to, to give voice to their own members who are from ethnic minorities. But I think going behind what you say, the trade unions were important outside race in being part of a kind of civil society that was able to talk about alternatives, um, which I think is what you're, 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 you're kind of, uh, you're, you're casting for is the kind of the big point. And I agree with you there. Um, both the Labour Party as it, as it stood then and trade union movement were, um, well, for one thing, it's hard to, it's, 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 it's hard to, um, to fathom now how far trade unions extended into, into civil society, how large their membership was. Um, but it's also hard to reconcile how even the Labour Party, which was even then starting to become more conservative in its politics, how still it was, it stood in opposition to Thatcherism and to the kind of social settlement that Thatcher represented. That's all gone by the bias in. So, so part of what's gone in that idea of political blackness is the idea that you could have an alternative society. And there I do agree with you that the, the, the retreat of unions, the, the, uh, the, the loss of a backbone by the Labour Party um, over the last 40 years, they've definitely played a part. Thank you. Um, there are some, some other comments and questions coming through on the Q&A and on the chat. Perhaps I could raise uh, one of them here. It's from Paul Deb, who um, recognizes the experiences you referred to in your talk, um, and wonders if you saw the seeming proliferation of specific cultural identities, perhaps most clearly expressed in ideas of intersectionality, as denying shared experiences of prejudice and their basis in economic reality. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. That question is, yeah. <laughs> that's a very good summary of uh, what I've just spent 11 yes. pages talking about. Yeah, thank you very much for that. <laughs> it, still begs, it still begs a very important question, which has to do with the denial of humanity. Yeah, I mean, what, one of the things that really does strike me about it is, um, is, is thinking about the women in my mother's staff room, right? they had very good politics um and yet they didn't use big big p political words to describe them i think my mother my mother did describe herself as socialist but she wouldn't have gone along you know terms like decolonization would have meant the british leaving india 
which by the way, my mother chiefly remembered for being given sweets at school playtime on that very day. Um, but, and words like intersectionality would have been, it's just, it's just not something you would be using in the context of staff room. And yet the, the understanding of how sex and uh, ethnicity and class and where you were located in, 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 in employment, how those things played into each other, the kind of kids that you dealt with, why it was that the staff room, uh, the, the staff room in a very tough area of London then, Hackney, um, why it was that they were all staffed with first generation migrants, pretty much. The understanding was absolutely instant. You didn't need to dress it up in terminology. Um, and I, I, I really regret the way that terms like intersectionality have come along, even though I can understand where they come from. But I regret how they've come along to as a kind of throat clearing exercise to try and find the commonality between me and someone like Lynette Huber, my mother's friend who I mentioned. And, and that I really regret. Thank you. Are there other responses, comments from, from just check on the chat? It's rather difficult because I need to check the chat in the Q&A. Uh, no. There's one from Harjot. Oh no, intersection, that was what you were quoting, yeah. Yes, it's the same, I think it's the same thought on the, on the, um, well, I suppose the negative consequences of intersectionality. Um, now there's an, I think there's something else that's come, come through. Um, oh, it's from uh, Shepali Frost who asks um, whether a same phenomenon in a more exaggerated way is being played out in modern India, vis-a-vis -vis minorities. And, um, I don't know, if, Aditya, if you've got any thoughts on that or if any other. I mean, the um, what's really striking um, about uh, now, I, I only I, I follow India through newspapers um, and websites rather than anything else, so I, I can't claim to be to be up close to it. But what what is interesting when, when I look across to India um, is how some of the same maneuvers and strategies are being followed around minority definition minority who gets to be called oppressed or not and and the the one that stands out is the one about uh patels and patels being classified as being other backward castes um which i think if if the british could come up with uh, 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 an, an OBC category for the UK, they, you could bet your bottom dollar that they would put the white working class in it. If only they could find the right cat, for, you know, the, the, the right category of surnames that they would put into it. Uh, they would, the, the, you would get some of the same thing that they're these protected characteristics. What there is going on in kind of counterpoint to to that to, to some of the stuff that you see in India is. Um, this discovery of left behind areas um, where certain parts of the UK are held to be particularly disadvantaged and in need of money. It just so happens that those left behind areas are um, the particular focus of um, uh, electoral concern by our Conservative government. So they're, they're reporting money quite nakedly to, 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 to parliamentary seats that they want to win. Um, and I think what both cases, the one that one I quoted in India and the thing about left behind areas here, tell you is about how quickly, once you define a, an area disadvantage, how quickly you mobilize that for political purposes and how quickly you, you, you use that as a kind of receptacle to, 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 to get money in. Thanks again. I think we're going to need to come to a, an end very soon um, because we have an, an hour for the session. Um, let me just have a last check and see if there's anything more. Oh, yes, there's an interesting question here, which I think, uh, Ahmed, uh, sorry, uh, Adif, you're very interested to hear your thoughts on. Uh, and this is a question about social media as a platform for protest. I, I can't see it on mine. Um, it's in the Q&A. I'm in the chat. Yeah, if you move to Q&A. Oh, hang on. <laughs> Have you got that? I'm, hang on. No. 
Oh, well, I'll, 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 ah, here we are. Question to you. Yeah, sorry, I'm right. You're, you're completely right. Any thoughts about social media as a platform for protest? Is that the right? Is that the right one, John? Yeah, that's the one. Maybe compared to the old slog of political activism, consensus building, long-term strategic thinking. Um, thank you very much, uh, who, who, whoever asked that. P. McD uh, for our, our asking that question. That's um, that's a very good question. And there is definitely something to it. Um, social media is very good for building thin communities which stretch very wide in the, in the way that I, I was suggesting in, in some of that and for acting as a, a, a microphone for a particular easily defined uh, protest. It's one of my friends, um, there was a question about trade unions um, earlier one of my friends um was the head of a trade union a small trade union in the uk that represented that 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 represented migrant workers in particular migrant workers in universities uh in particular uh so the cleaners at the university of london security guards porters and so on um and one of the things he pointed out to me was that if you ever uh, about the, the nature of his work. One of the things he pointed out to me was that if you ever got a CEO of a company on a mic that had been left on after an interview and he'd ever said, you know, what we ought to do is really make sure that black and brown workers get paid a lot less, that they don't get the same entitlements as the uh, the, the, the white work workforce, that um, you'd immediately get social media uproar about that. And yet he said, the point is that that process is actually going on uh, in the workplaces where he's trying to organise the entire time. It's just that as a process, it's much harder to, 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 to see by the naked eye. So there's, there's something about how you need a particular, really glaring, specific example, which no one can deny, which has got all the photos attached to it and so on, all the all this kind of very literal stuff that now goes into um, successful social media. And then there is, as the question points out, the kind of the, the, the failure to reach out beyond uh, the community, the thin community created by social media um, to actual social organisation, to, 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 to meeting other people, to listening to people in particular, rather than just talking over them. Um, social media is very good for talking over other people and very bad for listening to people. But, the, but one of the things I do just want to say to argue against myself a little bit and to argue against that question is we do have bodies uh, which are meant to be in civil society. So we have political parties that are meant to be in civil society and that are meant to not just to live on social media. We have trade unions, we have churches, we have all sorts of um, institutions in the UK which are meant to be part of civil society and could act as uh, organizers, mobilizers of popular discontent. It's really striking to me now to see that how far political parties in particular have got no real roots in civil society anymore. And you've seen that very clearly over the course of the pandemic that politics retreated to something that was held first in Westminster and then over Zoom reaching into the House of Commons. Actually the Labour Party which claimed to which claims to be the, the, the popular party, the on side of the masses, did very little in terms of organizing around COVID. They didn't open up food banks. They didn't uh, help uh, defend uh, renters in private uh, housing, which became a, a big flashpoint. Um, th they did very little indeed. It's also worth remembering that at one point the Conservative Party was the biggest political party in the UK, it had the biggest membership. Um, now it's got a membership of something like 70,000. Um, its roots in civil society have whipped away to nothing. So we've got a kind of double problem in which you've got social media, which sometimes looks like it's somehow the authentic voice of civil society at some points and yet isn't. And then you've got the the you've got the the long established institutions which used to be part of civil society also retreating, uh, unable to command the kind of legitimacy and authority that they once did as being voices of, of, of civil society. 
and unwilling also to engage with it. And, and this was true no matter whoever the leader of the Labour Party was. You know, it was, it's as true of Keir Starmer, the current leader of the Labour Party, as it was of Jeremy Corbyn, unfortunately, the previous leader of the Labour Party. It doesn't matter what politics you, you bring to the party. It is the case that Labour Party is this now very um, removed or, um, institution that people turn, trot out to vote for perhaps every four years and that's it. Hmm. Could I come back to that and reframe it in the form of, a, of, a, of another kind of question or another perspective? Mm. Um, are you describing a crisis, therefore, in national institutions? I mean, if you think about the national party, the national party, I'm sorry, I'm getting a lot of feedback. Um, the Labour Party is a, a national party, the Conservative is a national party. I mean, I'm interested in the relationship, if you like, of, of civil society to the nation here and whether it, it coheres with a national politics in the way that it once did. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure there's something to that, John, except don't forget, the Labour Party is broken down to constituency parties. So there are local organisations for each and every Labour Party. So they, they can go and do their own thing if they want. We have um, devolved administrations. It's not really clear to me that the Welsh government is seen as massively more um, legitimate than the Westminster government. I mean, if you go to, to Wales, they'll often talk about the, the Welsh government has been those people in, in Cardiff Bay, you know, that particular sock of the country below Cardiff. Um, local councils too. One of the things that really strikes me is how little, um, little trust people have in local councils. It's not just that they don't know who their local councillor is, it's that they, they, they see their local council as being a, a largely punitive force. I think a I mean, I, I think a, a couple of different things have happened. One is obviously spending cuts have happened in large force over the last 10 years, which means that your local council, your local school, your local hospital just can do less for you than it once did. Um, the other thing that's gone with that is a kind of attitude of punishment, that if you go to your local council for help you have to fill in forms which are 30 pages long and you're going to be treated with a certain amount of distrust if you want housing well you're waiting 10 years for, for housing from local council so and they that they will you know they will go through your your uh entitlement to it with a magnifying glass to try and find reason why they shouldn't give it to you that's one thing the other thing that's obviously happened is that some of those institutions along the way have not been affected by uh, spending cuts in the same way, but they're seen now as being, um, as being uh, that, that they've shed some of their social ob obligations or they've shed their rootedness in community. I mean, since this is being, uh, uh, this, this, this symposium is, is being facilitated by a university. I mean, the universities in the UK have become brands over the past 10, 15 years. Uh, brands um, which are increasingly less about the promotion of education uh, as they are about facilitating the student experience, which is what vice chancellors uh, now like to talk about when you when you when you open their brochures. Um, so in a variety of ways, the, the kind of institutions that one used to look to that would represent local civil society, national civil society, are both retreating from it, um, which is why I think there is this kind of, um, there is this kind of uh, move towards social media by some, s s some of these groups which previously would have felt they didn't have a voice. Social media with all of its constraints and problems. But... I don't even think there that people are really that taken in. I don't think anyone actually thinks that Mark Zuckerberg or whoever it is who now runs Twitter, you know, are their friends. I don't think they see those as anything more than platforms that, which are just handily convenient. I don't think there's an awful lot of faith in them as being a new kind of public square, as it were. 
I think there's just a general sense that there isn't a public square. And, and that, to some extent, is what brings this all round back to this issue about how, how identities are formed. And in the lack of a public square, in the lack of a sense of a collective endeavour, collective struggle, you have this walling off into ever smaller identities. Mm. Yeah. W one other question that's come through on the uh, chat and Q&A, I think, is um, why does migration exacerbate the human plight on the identity front? A question about migration. It'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on that, Peter. Why does... Let me... Why does my migration exacerbate the human plight on the identity front? I'm I'm never quite sure whether it is actually migration that um, that that is particularly troublesome, or whether it's the lack of um, care that's given to properly integrate migrants into the rest of society. Um, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example from 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 from, from my own upbringing. So the, I, I was brought up in uh, a particular part of North London where I pretty much live still. Um, I live two and a half miles from where I grew up. Um, in two thousand and one, uh, the area in which I grew up in two thousand and one, the census showed it as being two thirds white. By 2011, the next census, uh, the, the it was shown to be two thirds non-white. Huge change in just in just ten years. Um, we had a um, conservative council a, in charge for a large part of that. The deputy leader of the council referred to the area in which I grew up as being akin to a UN feeding station because it was so full of minorities who were not very rich. Um, I spoke to one of the largest my ethnic minorities. Uh, um, uh, I've done a lot of kind of research around the new ethnic minorities which have taken up home in the area in which I used to live. One of the biggest groups is Bulgarians. One of the guys I spoke to had uh, been um, uh, one of the longest standing immigrants to uh, the area. So he'd been there before the EU um, uh, had opened up to its borders to Bulgaria. And he said to me, you know, before I came to Britain, I'd spent a few years in Germany. In Germany, um, he said, we were given bicycles by uh, the local, uh, um, local church. Uh, and we were taught um, in a month how to fit into local society. We've given all the various tools about how the schools work, how the health system works, what you do with this, that, and the other. We were given all of that and we learned it all within a month. And he said, coming to this country, no one told us anything. It took us a year to learn the same things um, as we learned in a month in Germany. And there's no, I mean, it goes without saying, there's no provision for, there's barely any provision for English language teaching in that area, despite the fact that you've got hundreds yeah easily well over 100 different languages now being spoken there uh, and a lot of people who don't speak english that well but there's no provision for english language teaching there's no provision for citizenship training you know none of those sorts of things about how the local welfare system works or how the council works no no, no none of that works it, what you get instead is a kind of form of a well you could call it Chinese whispers, you might also call it Turkish whispers or Bulgarian whispers or, or whatever, because you get different minority groups which are telling each other how the system works um, and very little kind of interfacing with uh, the local arm of the state, the local council, let alone the national arm of the state. Um, and all of this is exacerbated by the fact that if you want to get your entitlements nowadays in the UK, you have to use computers. And obviously a lot of people who are new, new to the country who don't necessarily have a lot of money, they don't have the data to fill in a 30 page form to get basic, a, a low level of benefit. And yet this is part of what happens the entire time. So I, I'm not sure it's m migration per se, or, or, although obviously migration does pose an issue, but it's not an ins insoluble problem. I, I, can't, I can't see it as such. 
Um, one of the welcome things that has happened, I think, within my lifetime, and and by the way, I, in my talk, I concentrated on on trying to form an argument and trying to provoke a, a discussion. Um, there are other things which I could point to as 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 much more grounds for optimism. And one of the things is is that in in my childhood, um, there the the public discussion about migrants was they had to choose whether to integrate or assimilate. Um, and um, for instance, I, I wasn't taught Bengali at home by my two Bengali parents because um, the orthodoxy of time was that if you taught their child taught a child their mother tongue, they'd get very confused when it came to learning English. That thing about, you know, you have to choose to integrate, you can't, you know, you, in fact, you should ideally assimilate. Uh, you shouldn't learn your own language. You shouldn't carry around bits of, uh, you know, any cultural, any other cultural trappings. I think that's all gone, which is a good thing. The problem is that there's been no new dialogue about um, how you then interface with society, with state, um, where, how you get entitlements, how this country best uses the immense wealth of talent and languages and knowledge that people bring to this country. Um, th there's no dialogue about that. They're seen as, as they're, they're seen as a problem to be managed still. Thank you. Um, I think we need to bring the session to a close now. Uh, we're at the hour. Um, thank you very much, Aditya, for, for a very thought-provoking uh, presentation and uh, response to the questions too. Um, it's, it's very interesting when you have a discussion which identifies something that once existed in the past and has gone missing and raises a question about what's missing now. And it's very difficult to describe what's missing now, but I think you've, you've provided a very good sort of because of course, going back to the past is not going to be the way of, of finding the solution to what's missing now. It's as though there's a, there's a further sort of stage in the invention of social institutions, in the invention of ways of, of talking to each other, which we haven't quite got to yet. And I think your talk has, has illuminated that very, very, uh, very well. It's, it's, it's um, a very good beginning to the, to the symposium. So, so on behalf of everybody who's listening and, and um, contributing to the discussion, thanks very much indeed. So thank you, Aditya. And there's a 15 minute break now, is there? Can we make it a 10 minute break? I think that should be fine, 10 minutes. Yeah, break. okay, so um, in, in India, it is now six o'clock, is it? Yes. So come back at 10 past six. Good. Okay. Thanks very much. Well done, Aditya. That was really great. That was good. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoyed yeah. that very much. Looking forward to the written up, uh, the transcript. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. Honestly, yeah. how much value? How much value are you getting out of me? <laughs> Okay. It was, it was what, your, can I ask what the book is going to be about? Yeah, it's about um, yes. Th thank you, John. It's about where I where I grew up. Oh. It's about areas. So it's called um, the the area in which I grew up is called Edmonton. Is called Edmonton. Uh, it's about a hundred thousand people. Mm -hmm. um, it's gone through massive, massive change, even within my own lifetime. I'm I'm forty six, um, and it used to be where. MK Electric, Thorny MI, Ripple, um, where the first light bulb, electric light bulbs were mass produced. Um, I mean, a, a massive hub of light industry that, um, that has all just gone along with, you know, industry across, manufacturing industry across the UK. And yet London, first of all, tends to forget about its light industrial past, however recent it was, but also, um, because it is in London, because this area is in London, it's it's got all these London problems. So there's huge pressure on housing. Um, 
And in a way, instead of becoming a kind, instead of it being once it's kind of, kind of productive, working class prosperity, which also it did accept, however begrudgingly, migrants uh, to live in the cheap houses, um, it's become a place of kind of working class poverty. Um, and the it's turned into kind of banlieue along the, the kind of lines that, that you see in Paris. So yeah. all the problems that were once in a city have just moved to places like Edmonton without, it seems to me, very much discussion of how that's happened, why that's happened, what the effects of that are. So the borough in which I live, London Borough of Enfield, uh, has the second highest serious youth violence in London, second only to Westminster, which has got Soho. Uh, Edmonton has got the biggest sex work industry in London, bigger than King's Cross used to be. Okay. Um, it's the Edmonton is the evictions hotspot of England, and on and on, like a whole series of these problems in an area of only 100,000 people, right at the tip of uh, North, North London. Um, and because it's now a Labour stronghold, has been for, for decades, um, it doesn't really have much of a political voice. And, it, and because it's on the outskirts of London, it doesn't really get seen in the same way. Um, so uh, it, what I'm trying to do is to try and kind of tell the story of the area kind of with it over the course of my lifetime mm. um, and through the lives of people who live there now. So it's kind of, the, the idea is it's, it's largely reporting, it's not polemical. Um, but with bits of analysis and context kind of along the way to show how these are not just Edmonton problems, but these are also London problems, Britain problems as well. Um, it's It's been quite a fraught process trying to do reporting over the pandemic yeah, uh, and try and see people and all the rest of it. And uh, as I said in my talk, you know, things have been derailed by the, the death of my mother and then we had a, a baby uh the month afterwards so, so we've now got two very small children but uh I, it's kind of coming along bit by bit i'm hopeful that at least this year i'll get um a draft done or get most of a draft done uh we'll see thanks for asking no i, I was interested because i i couldn't find any information about it when i <laughs> searched on the web <laughs> you know i went to the um penguin allen lane site and yeah. But, um, they just said you were writing a, a book. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just check that you can see this picture? I yeah. can see the picture on it, yeah. Okay. So let me stop sharing for now. What uh, happened when you tried Aditya? Because you had those very good... Yeah, I had a good cartoon. Really yeah. Good... Uh, I, don't, I don't know what happened. I, I, it seemed to be sharing fine, and then it just stopped doing it second time around i don't know if i i don't think i changed the settings but oh something happened <laughs> it was fine <laughs> we, we miss mr missed up on the titillating headlines but we can look them up later yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> well is it i always find it a shock to actually see them again i mean it's uh you you sort of you you try to well, part of you, me at least, tries to kind of cut them out of my mind. And then when you see them presented to you again, you realise they're, you know, how, how savage they are, really. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I shouldn't be surprised, I know, but I always am. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm just trying to make sure that I have, can access the two pictures I want to. Um, so it says, and you can see this one, right? This one is. Uh, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, should we start soon, Ahmed? Yeah, uh, just another like four or five minutes and then we'll be. Uh, okay.
it's quite heroic heroic to to kind of do this on on zoom i think um <laughs> well, i was i was getting feedback on my voice yeah and i i, I, could that. I mean i could hear it but it's bad enough at the best of time <laughs> the um yeah but there's a good number of people taking part yeah i think there would have been more if it hadn't been for you know things that have been happening mm. well it's it's very encouraging i think um yeah Shabir has a very lifelike picture uh, for his screensaver or whatever. It's oh, there, there he is. <laughs> that's, that's showing the view from my office, which I've not been to for quite a while now. Wondering where, where, where that view is from. That's anyway. over the university parks. Uh, we have a oh, nice. new building right next to it. Unfortunately, it overlooks the rugby field, not the cricket pitch, which is a bit further to the right. That's a shame, yeah. So, but I see people getting themselves muddy all the time and it feels nice to be in a dry office, yes. <laughs> well, so, um, I was going to yeah. just say, Amit, I think it's actually going quite well for a uh, Zoom webinar in the sense that we didn't have uh, significant technical problems. And... Yeah. Uh, uh, Apart from the odd disturbance, I think the sound was quite clear on the whole. Uh, yeah. So, so I, I would, uh, I would consider it a success so far. <laughs> yes. Technically, I mean, I mean the content that of has, process. That it hasn't been a complete. Uh, no, no. I thing. think well, your support team at Ashoka is pretty good. So. Yeah, yeah. No, it's gone well so far, and a great talk to begin with. Yes. Uh, uh, just that having breaks is a little dangerous because people go away to make a cup of tea and they it's don't dangerous. get back on time. Do you suggest that we not have breaks? Uh, well, I think, well, I suppose... Uh, five minute break. It's, yeah, I think five minutes is better because uh, otherwise it's a bit longer than... I mean, it's quite different. The dynamic is quite different from a real live meeting where you no, actually see people, you know, lounging around right. outside, having a cigarette, whatever. You can right, rush yeah, them in. I, um, experience of a Zoom um, symposium. Mm. So, um, because in the actual symposiums, we give people a little bit of time to go and, you know, just go out, stretch their arms sure. and legs, and have a cup of tea. And yeah, uh, yeah. But, so. Uh, but 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 what that, you can't do is go out and yell at everyone. Come back in. We are going to restart. <laughs> That's yes, the thing. That. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, That's the I like best, actually. So yes. it's not possible to do that here. Yeah. Yeah. I was just no, going to say one, one, just one point. Uh, I think it might be simpler if everybody types in their questions into chat rather than because Aditya seemed to uh, be having difficulty keep monitoring both the Q and A and the chat. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we can start now, John. It's it's yeah. Fine. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay, well, welcome to the second session of the symposium uh, when we're going to hear from Amit Chowdhury. Um, I don't want to spend long introducing him because um, I'm sure his work is, is familiar to many of the people who are tuning in this evening. Um, there's a sort of multiplication of nouns that can be applied to him. He's a novelist, a poet, a musician, a critic, a translator, an editor. Um, those nouns give some indication of the of the variety of forms that he's he's worked in. Um, his work has, of course, won widespread international recognition. Um, in 1999, he won the um, LA Times Book Prize for his novel Freedom Song. Um, in 2002, the Sayatia Academy Award for uh, for New World, and in 2012, uh, the Insufficient prize for the humanities and literary studies, um, a recognition there of his critical work, I think, um, critical work which has been collected in um, uh, volumes like Clearing a Space and, and Telling Tales. 
Um, citing prizes will already have um, caused Amit a certain recoil because I know he's become very skeptical of the prize circuit and the literary prize circuit. Um, but it does give some indication at least of, 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 this, of the range and, and uh, international reach um, of his readership and of the critical recognition his work has achieved. Um, his latest book, uh, Finding the Raga, an improvisation on Indian music, has just been published by the uh, New York Review uh, of Books uh, imprint in the US and will be published, I think, in India and in the UK fairly shortly. And clearly somebody introducing him is confronted with the easy uh, option of saying that his work is so various and so diverse uh, that it is impossible and even foolish to try and summarize it. Uh, so I'm going to try and uh, do the impossible and the foolish and very briefly summarize what I think um, his work, the way in which his work talks to me at least. And it does so in um, a number of different ways. One is something that I value in him greatly and that is an intelligent impatience with various orthodoxies. Um, those might be orthodoxies about uh, writing novels. Um, they might be orthodoxies about uh, critical taste and critical sensibility. Um, they might indeed be orthodoxies about the way in which you understand the correlation between different uh, musical traditions. But the interesting and distinctive, in my mind, very distinctive thing about Annet is that that intelligent impatience is also combined with um, the discovery of creative alternatives to the orthodoxies that he um, resists and wants to work outside of. Um, and this discovery is always very striking to me, this discovery of creative alternatives, because quite often it involves opening up our understanding of a, a tradition of practice, of writing um, that has been overlooked or ignored. So it, it doesn't interestingly involve a rejection of the past so much as a reconsideration of the way in which we currently understand the past. That has produced a work which is based upon the third thing that has always struck me about it and it's a work which in which there is a continuing practice of writing uh, not regardless of the different genres that um, he's published in, but which is very interestingly not going to be confined by any of those. And that means that he often produces work that is distinct, um, unique in my view, in the genres that he does choose to write in. This evening, he's going to be talking to us uh, about uh, decolonization as literary activism. Um, it's as always a great pleasure to introduce him uh, to, to you and Amit, I'll pass over to you now. Um, thank you, John. It's it's uh, it's wonderful to have you here again uh, at the symposium, and uh, great to have you. A privilege to have you uh, introducing me, um, and with those kind of really extremely generous words. Uh, thank you. Um, am I? Uh, I, I'm, I'm sort of audible, right? I mean, I can be heard. Um, so, I've always wondered why I've made things difficult for myself as a, as a writer, as a practitioner. But today, it's uh, uh, as a speaker that I've made these things difficult for myself by. Um, I mean, this is not the first time I've done this, but, but you were scribbling notes a few hours ago for this talk. Um, so I have to see if I can make sense of my notes, which I'm, yeah, I'm going to refer to from here. Um, I think the best thing is to do, the best, best thing is to plunge into it and, and, and find out what happens. Um, bear with me if I stutter or pause, it, it'll mean that I can't, I can't read my handwriting or can't make sense of the notes. Um, the background, let me give you a bit of background to this talk, which is mysteriously titled Decolonization as Literary Activism, if I re remember correctly. Um, I'll, I'll maybe get around to explaining what I mean by that title. 
background to the talk is, uh, as usual, quite often, as it is with with things I write in essays or talks that I give, conversations with people I know, conversations with friends, um, things um, talked about in the past. In this case, maybe around 2012 in London, when, when I was having in London and Oxford, I, was, I must have been teaching at, at, it must have been the autumn, I must have been teaching at the University of East Anglia and finding, uh, you know, uh, on days when I had time, I would I would go to London and hang out with a couple of friends. And I remember talking to one of them. You might even have been Aditya. I, I can't remember where we talked about the fact that isn't it strange uh, that um, you know there used to be two or three well-known journalists when I first arrived in England. Two or three well-known journalists uh, writing in the Observer or Guardian or whatever of non-European you know, origin, South Asian origin, or from, a, from, from part of the colonized world. And, 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 and then um, there used to be a certain number of people in, um, in law, maybe. Of course, Indian doctors were well known, South Asian doctors, for being, you know, uh, for, for there being many of them. Um, so it was a it was a cliche, and then speaking about the early eighties, a time of emerging from and still marred by great racism in the in in, in Britain, um, and and part of that kind of disarmingly uh, with with expressed with disarming sort of bluntness by Thatcher. Uh, Aditya referred to the fact that she she felt uh, swamped in terminal 3 she meant that you know terminal 3 is the terminal at, at heathrow airport which where where people sort of uh, depart for 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 you know the, where international departures take place but but not so much to europe but you know uh, in the middle east uh, africa asia so she felt swamped over there. So the, the early '80s was still emerging from that, but into, into the blue, into the into into the boom of of uh, '80s Britain, uh, the, the the crushing of um, trade unions, which which came up earlier uh, in 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 Aditya's talk. Um, so I I was saying to Aditya probably in 2012, I think uh, that. Isn't it strange? Is the same number of well-known South Asian or non-white journalists in the press as in the early '80s? Now, in 2012, uh, after that, after 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 the, all all the kind of racism that had to be fought in the '70s and from which the '80s was emerging in Britain, uh, it th there was a there was a spell of of this experiment called multiculturalism. Uh, and and paying homage to to this idea of diversity, um, and um, and it almost seemed to work. I mean, it might have been cosmetic or superficial on some levels, but it seemed to work on other levels. Uh, at least people stopped being openly racist. Institutional racism came up now and again uh, as 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 a genuine worry, but uh, maybe change was afoot. One would have then imagined that. There would have been a substantial change also in spheres of life, like like journalism. The one, if there were two journalists from a particular part of the world in 1983, then there should have been five, maybe six, but that hadn't happened. In fact, why why should I have been why should I have been checking these numbers? It, it was a sense of something having closed down, um, and. That's why I was having this conversation. And I had a similar conversation with, with a, another friend, uh, Sunetra Gupta, scientist. And neither, I think, Aditya nor Sunetra had noticed this as such. I mean, they were aware of racism, but they hadn't noticed this. Uh, and I can, I can date this conversation going back to maybe 2012, because it was roughly two, two years before Lenny Henry, the comedian, uh, gave his BAFTA speech where he was one of the first people to speak about the fact that 
wh why are black actors not getting jobs? Uh, so, so this came up as a wake up call as a, in a moment of startlement for lots of people. Can this be true? You know, uh, but something had closed down, which, which led to my conversation maybe in 2012, Lenny Henry's uh, 2014 uh, BAFTA speech and the roads must fall um, movement in Oxford in 2015. So the, a year after Lenny Henry's speech and three, probably three years after I'd had that conversation or those conversations. Um, so what had happened? So I'm speaking of a time here that the, 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 the speak, I'm speaking of a time of something closing down and something seeming to open up. Uh, what, what, what seems to open up? It's the end of the Cold War, the Berlin Wall comes down. We are, I'm speaking, I'm starting from 1990. Uh, and um, it's in 1990 that the, around then that the Cold War ends, the world becomes unipolar. Uh, America be becomes the one kind of central power. Um, the free market is inaugurated in various parts of the world, including India, around that time, deregulation takes place. And um, there is a financial, spiritual, and intellectual hegemony of capital being brought into place for the first time worldwide. Uh, bubbles begin to be created, new bubbles that are created across the world through networks, creating new elites benefiting from uh, this new world order. Um, these bubbles can also make it seem like they are the world or they are that country which they claim to represent and they are often suspected of sucking out the rest. So it's not only just one country against another, it could be one part of the country becoming the bubble and claiming to be the entire country and then in some way sucking out the energy and resources from the rest of the country. So in, in the UK, it would be London, I suppose, and certain parts of London. In America, it would be New York. In India, it would be Delhi. Delhi that becomes the center of uh, academic advancement, intellectual advancement, the media. Uh, that, with this also comes the illusion that those places are India or those places are Britain or America. And then as far as America is concerned, New York then in a way, a few streets, four streets in New York maybe shown again and again, become the world. That's the nature of the bubble. Um, at this time from the 1990s onwards is also the time when um, we see the rise of the right and the extreme right. Uh, in India, we see the demolition of the Babri Masjid. Uh, in 1990 uh, to 91, we have the, the first Gulf War we have military intervention in Afghanistan, bombings in Sudan, the rise of Al Qaeda. All this is happening as um, it's not coexisting with the bubble. The bubble exists. It's seemingly impermeable and impervious. What's the connection between the two? We have to figure that out. Then uh, we turn the corner, the millennium ends we are in the 2000s and we have 9-11. And, uh, and then we have the misadventure that's called the second Gulf War, uh, the, the, the search, the abortive search for weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Around this time, the Booker Prize morphs into a particular kind of prize. Uh, that's become 
be becomes increasingly not an arbiter of literary judgment, but an instrument for the market and for publishers. Uh, in this time, old, old labor uh, and the old left is either put on the shelf or it again transforms itself into Thatcherite versions of the Labour Party, New Labour, um, other kind of Thatcherite versions come into existence in politics in the UK. I've right now just got, got, gone back to the UK to speak about that particular landscape, which is characteristic in a way of what's happening uh, in various places. Uh, and 9-11, with 9-11 and with, with what's been happening in the 90s, we also see the return of a category called the West in discussions, Western values. Um, not Western civilization, which to, for which we need to go back uh, to the first half of the 20th century, and we need to kind of see the rebuttals of, of Western civilization by extremely interesting left-wing cosmopolitans, let's say like John Berger, rebuffing Kenneth Clark's version of civilization, the civilization of, of the West in art uh, through his ways of seeing. Civilization, the word is put, put aside, values comes in, Western values, or just the West will do. Um, I think these are all these are uh, uh, um, instances of something closing down, which would then lead um, to those conversations and uh, a, a greater and greater sense of disquiet. So certain histories are being erased. Um, we, are, we are still not sure what, what's happening. Um, it's also a time, this, these two decades that I'm talking about, um, from the 1990 to now, um, is also time, especially the 1990s, of a marginalization of various forms. So since we are talking about literature, this is a, a, a symposium in literary activism. Uh, we, we should also mention that forms like poetry are for the first time um, seen to be redundant or valueless or untenable, unfeasible. So um, Oxford University Press um, closes or, or shuts down its poetry list in 1998. And uh, irrespective of what your uh, ethnicity is, uh, if you are interested or in poetry and English, and if you are making discoveries in these things, uh, you, you would feel bereft by no longer having access, let's say, to Basil Bunting or Derek Mahan. You no longer have access to those particular books. And those, uh, Bunting is dead, but Mahan and others younger than him would need to find other venues through which to make their work available. Um, the, so, so something that might be called not something as bland as a, a, a a human inheritance, but certainly a, 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 an, an inheritance to which all of us should feel um, the possibility of access uh, is being closed down. It's being closed down for, for everybody. Um, at the same time, the Booker Prizes and the British publishing uh, industries insistence that the novel somehow is exciting. This is the 90s again I'm talking about, that the novel is exciting because it's, uh, it's synonymous with new, something called new literatures. So the old uh, modern realist novel about the English suburb is, is, is no longer of interest. We're getting these amazing freewheeling narratives from other parts of the world which have these amazing oral and myth-making traditions. And, and, uh, and now we are bringing them to you and the Booker Prize and the British publishing industry uh, claims that this is what 
the most interesting incarnation of the novel is, and this is what is coming to us, while at the same time, we begin to know less and less about the literary histories of those countries, especially the literary histories outside of the English language, that those novels are supposed to be coming to us from. We begin to know less and less about those histories and those languages. So, so we are looking again also at the rise of English as a, as a new way of thinking about this new world uh, intimately connected with um, the new value system of this world. Um, so when we speak about decolonization, it needs to be situated here. Uh, not just in the history of colonization, but in, uh, in the fact of this new world coming into existence. It needs to take, we need to take this into account. Uh, we need to also understand that this is a very tenacious world. The bubble is extremely tenacious. So we have Al-Qaeda, we have 9-11, we have ISIS, uh, we have the 2008 crash. So the 2008 crash, let's say we, we, we didn't like what Al-Qaeda was up to. Uh, it seemed that it threatened everything that you and I believed in. Let's say we didn't like uh, the new world order either, the one that Al-Qaeda didn't like. Just as a, sometimes, you know, you have a secret kind of uh, um, empathy with the psychotic in, in the horror film that, that you're watching because you don't like the good guy. There's something wrong with the good guy. So, but still, I mean, you have, you, you, you're still hanging on to rationality. You don't like Al-Qaeda. Of, 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 of course, they'll destroy you. You don't like ISIS. When the market crash comes along, then it, it kind of really hurts your interest. But over there, you think maybe this pernicious world order is now going to be shaken a little bit. You know, it, it's a horrible way for it to happen. And I didn't wish it to happen, but maybe this will lead to something. And then you realize two years later or four years later, when I was, which is when I was having these conversations, that nothing has been shaken. That, that 2008, the, uh, the crash happens. 2013, um, Lenny Henry is saying black actors are not getting roles. There's a connection there to do with the tenacity of the bubble, that the bubble, the order it brought into place in the 90s has not been shaken in any way. If anything, it's gone, got stronger. Um, I feel the same thing will happen with the pandemic that will only energize the bubble. The bubble will always use it to close down things that remain as vestiges of the older order uh, that has to do with multiple histories of modernity and thinking. Uh, the, the, this world the new order will use what seem like threats as justifications to close things down and strengthen itself. I, I'm mentioning this only to make people aware, including students and others, that decolonization not be used in this way. That, 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 that whatever, whatever disquiet leads us to have this um, discussion here today and tomorrow must must be part of 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 a of a more meaningful and deeper conversation recovering certain things rather than continuing to close down so that the nar narrowness of the bubble becomes more and more energized uh, decolonization uh, is can become an exercise in closing things down in 
conversations to do with literature uh, and culture between students and professors and strengthening admin that wants to control more and more these, these conversations, these relationships and the context of those relationships. <clears throat> Having said that we must situate it here in, in what happened in the last uh, 20 years, this, this, this discussion we're having about decolonization, it, it, there's no harm in looking back at, at colonial history and look for correspondences as well as um, departures, avenues, and possibilities suggested by the history of that time, late 19th century, early 20th century. I'm going to just talk about India for, for a little bit. Um, one might say that a similar closing down uh, happened in, in India with um, the, the so-called mutiny or the first war of independence in 1857 before which the relationship between the so-called colonizer and colonized in India was more, more fluid, more open. But after that, and then with the swift transference of power from the East India Company to the crown, uh, a closing down occurred. A, a kind of thin racism typology could come into being based on that closing down. Um, also important is the amendment in 1884 to the Ilbert Bill, which was proposed in order to give Indian magistrates uh, equal rights to try Englishmen as, say, English mag magistrates in, 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 or judges in India. The 1884 uh, amendment uh, uh, introduced um, checks on, on the possibility of that happening. So the 1883 Ilbert Bill and what it proposed antagonized uh, the Europeans, the white English colonials. Uh, the, the change that kind of contained the powers of Indian magistrates in 1884 antagonized the Indians. Uh, so, but is, uh, is that clear what I've just said about the Ilbert Bill? Um, and, and that that is another process there in in this in this separation, and this bubble, the creation of a bubble called the British Raj, a bubble from which it took a long time. Maybe we have not fully recovered from it. For the for the British, for for let's say even somebody as well-read and educated as Jeremy Paxman, the, 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 the India is the British Raj. He would not have heard of a, a Bengali avant-garde or a non-narrative filmmaker like Manikal. This would be news to him. Why should it be news to him? Because the conversation closed down then, a bubble was created. The bubble was extremely tenacious and it became an inheritance. Um, however, that doesn't mean that it wasn't the bubble that was unreal, uh, and it doesn't mean that extraordinarily, extraordinary mo modernities didn't come into existent, existence at that time. If we're talking about 1857, 1858, it's in 1860, uh, 61 that uh, these extraordinary experiments in Bengali, to speak of one language, uh, in poetry, in fiction, in, in prose writing that, that isn't quite poetry or fiction like the Night Owls uh, sketches, Hutam Pachar Naksha by Kali Prashan Mushingo, 1860, I think, 1861, Meghnad Bhatkapo, uh, Michael Modushudan Dotto, uh, The Birth of Tagore uh, that year, um, 
I hope I'm getting my dates right, but I think they're more or less then. And then the coming to maturity of Tagore around the time, you know, but by, by the time the Ilbert bill came into existence and the bubble of the Raj began to be put in place, uh, Tagore was co contributing to extremely interesting uh, groundbreaking breaking ideas to do with how poetry could uh, engage with history without representing history. So, so what I mean by this is an extraordinary uh, tradition of modernity and practice and activism in, in literary thinking and artistic thinking, uh, querying all categories is coming into place at the time that the bubble world is also establishing itself and consolidating itself. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, I'm consulting my notes again myself. So what I mean to say in this first bit is that the that these these languages that come about in India at the time, I've spoken about Bengali, but others too, also Indian classical music, um, and the way it becomes a new concert practice, attended to by by educate primarily not by by educated uh, middle class Indians. Uh, that these are history, these are histories of modernity and also histories of decolonization. Uh, and 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 uh, now we have uh, forgotten these histories, with especially in the last twenty years, with the rise of the English language, especially. Uh, I want to now um, speak quickly about a film, Notting Hill. Notting Hill, Hugh Grant. Julia Roberts, um, 1999, 1998, the, the, the OUP, OUP closed its uh, poetry list and other, th other interesting things happened at the end of the 90s. But, but this, uh, I want to place Notting Hill in this discussion, this not the place I'll come to in a second. Uh, uh, so, When I watched Notting Hill, I had a strange, I, I, I was asking my wife whether I've ever seen it from start to finish because I've only seen it on TV and only seem to catch it in the middle of something. Um, and, and, but whenever I watch it, I feel this kind of strange sense of disorientation. It's not as, tr as strong as being swamped. I mean, uh, Thatcher felt swamped at ter Terminal 3, Notting Hill, the film, I feel swamped by the number of white people in it. But I won't say that it's as strong a feeling as, as the one Thatcher had. It's just a slight disorientation. Where am I? Which city is this? Then I hear it's London and Notting Hill. I think, but London, hmm, where are the women in burqas? Um, something is wrong over here. Um, going to the place, um, the actual place, Notting Hill. Um, it was um, until the 80s, a predominantly black area, not a safe area, not a, within quotes, good area to live in. And then the 90s, the, the time we've been talking about, deregulation, Booker Prize, Al-Qaeda. This is when it gets gentrified. I remember discovering gentrification in Notting Hill when a friend of mine from Oxford invited me and for the first time I had antipasti in his house for lunch. Um, and uh, so 1999, Notting Hill uh, arrives in the world, the film, and it also exemplifies this new love affair that Britain is having with America, Hugh Grant and Julia Roberts. And, um, and I think to myself, where are the women in burqas? Where are the black people? Uh, you know, where are the Middle Eastern people? Where are the South Asians? Uh, um, this, is, this is not 
accurate. And this I think to myself as somebody who knows London, but as a lover of film and as a writer, I do not want accuracy to be uh, restored through correct representation or correction. I think it would be a disaster if we threw in a few people of color, as they call, call them in America, into that mix. That is not the way it works as far as I'm concerned, and which is why we are having this chat in a literary activism uh, symposium where we are trying to look at literature and the arts as a way, as, as a specific way of thinking and solving particular problems that it faces. And one of the problems it faces is representation. So it does not want to represent in that particular way. Um, so, uh, um, some kind of uh, noise. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, can you check if you've muted yourself and everybody? Um, so, what what we want is what what we want to be restored is not. Uh, numbers of for, that would accurately represent, but on part of the filmmaker, of the one who's imagining, an act of noticing. It's only through noticing that those histories, not only those people, but those histories come to us. Um, and noticing pertains as much to what's been omitted, to find them there, to notice them, uh, uh, as it does to what's being shown. Uh, so the English people in Notting Hill are not real English people, but they, they, they are themselves representational or representative. They are not being noticed actually. They haven't been noticed for who they are by the filmmaker. This, this, this brings about a certain kind of emptiness to the, to the film. Um, the act of noticing doesn't only have to do with what's in the main story, the main characters and protagonists, but what's in the crowd, what's in the background. There, there is no hierarchy here to, to where the gaze will fall and notice, and from which source something might be recovered. It could be in the main story, it could be in the crowd. So uh, not only are uh, Black people missing, Asian people missing, uh, children are missing, seem to be missing. Decrepit old people seem to be missing. At least they don't come back to me as being presences in the film as they do from Ealing comedies from the 50s or Rome uh, open city, uh, Rossellini. So uh, let me just share this screen with you to show you a couple of pictures. Can you see uh, these pictures? Sorry, I, I want to get to the right picture. Please bear with me. Oh, God. Excuse me, I'm uh, really sorry, but is annoying, but I'll try one, one more time. Can you see this picture? This is a picture of, uh, uh, um, of a Sikh family in the London underground in 1940. Uh, and and uh, for me, it is not a picture that aims to represent a Sikh family in London. It, it is a moment of seeing, a moment of discovery. It is also uh, a synecdoche in that nothing is mentioned, no attempt is made to place it within London or within the dispersal of, of a Sikh community. It does what a synecdoche in a work, in, a, in an imaginative work is supposed to do. It, 
wants you to engage with the world that has been left out. It doesn't stand for a world. It suggests something. It invites engagement and imaginative engagement. It wants you to imagine. It wants you to notice this is something that has been noticed and not put in. And then it, it's not a marker. And then it, it's inviting you to imagine. The imagined world that it's asking you to kind of take part in, you know, creating in your head uh, is something that cannot be finalized uh, through us saying that this means that this stands for that. It's, it's too interesting and strange a photograph to not have captured uh, the strangeness of, of seeing something new and having suggested a world beyond it. It's not merely representational. So I would say that in that sense, we have to look at when we say decolonize the curriculum, open up the canon, we have to look at these things in the same way as correct representation not being a solution, but a problem. Uh, we have to engage more thoroughly in being true to what we've noticed. In, in the lifetime of experience we've had as readers and writers. Noticed from what we've read, what we've overheard, what we've seen. The canon is a static inheritance. Um, and if we just correct it, uh, we still stay with the same structure where, uh, you know, the primacy is being con conferred upon the act of legitimizing rather than noticing, rather than opening things up. Uh, for, for, for writers, so because, because, the, because the term dead white males has been bandied about a lot in the last 20 years, Problematically for writers, whatever your gender or color or uh, your ethnicity, um, for, for imaginative writers, very often it's the, it's, the, it's the present which is dead, the present which is static, which needs to be revitalized. No writer looks around the present cultural milieu and thinks, this is fantastic. They most probably think, this is absolutely ossified. And what to them then becomes a way of revitalizing what they understand to be the set of relationships that creates what is in interesting to them at that point about culture or writing is often somebody who might be dead, but might seem contemporary and immediate and urgent in a way that the person right next to you who's of the same gender as you, the same color of you, as you doesn't. It's because you're so disconnected from that person that you turn to this other uh, set of people who may not be actually present. So it's, it's act completely misleading to think that the writer finds the most kind of persuasive uh, company in what they're trying to do in people who are exactly like them and who belong to the same moment. Um, that doesn't mean they turn to a static version. They, they are against the static. They don't turn to a static version of the past. They, are, they do want things to not be static. Unfortunately, the present is often static in, in, in the cultural context. Uh, so whether it's Tagore who turns back to Kalidas, not as a repository of Sanskrit values, but as a kind of proto-modern, 
whether it's uh, Ralph Ellison about who Kenan Malik quoted recently in the Observer saying the Negro American writer is also an heir of the human experience, which is literature. And this might be more important to him than his living folk tradition. So he's not talking blandly about world literature or about humanism, but something else which is living for him in, com in comparison to what's supposed to be his kind of, you know, proper place, the folk tradition around him. Um, Kolatka's engagement with the low caste poet Tukaram and with William Carlos Williams at the same time. Namdev Dhasal's, uh, um, the, 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 the Dalit, so called untouchable uh, uh, poets, kind of in, interest in um, Ambedkar, uh, uh, the, the socialist Ram Manohar Lohia, and the major European poets. We, because he said that he became interested, his teacher got him interested in poetry. He immediately became an anomaly and misfit, but he loved poetry, but he found that the poetry was being introduced to by his teacher, who was also uh, a, a lower caste a man, uh, um, was extremely conventional, conventional Marathi poetry. It was reading uh, European poets that got him interested in a different kind of poetry. So. Uh, uh, these are all parts of cultural histories which, which, which cannot be addressed by corrections and representation. Um, I'm coming to the end of my uh, talk, uh, but I don't think I have time to say this last bit. I'll try and say it in as short a kind of summary as possible. I'm just going back to Said for a second. There are three things I want to say about Edward Said because he, He's a part of, 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 of our thinking. Some of what he has said is necessary. Some of what he has said needs us to revisit what he said and examine it and, and uh, examine our relationship to it. The first is his very famous thing about, uh, uh, you know, uh, his account of Orientalism, Orientalist scholarship, Oriental, Orientalism as a worldview that, um, is a form of knowledge that masters what it's studying, in this case, the Orient, through representation. And I would say, as I've said to my students recently, that Orientalism is only one powerful subsidiary and offshoot of a general trend since the Renaissance through neoclassicism or through oil painting to make representation and mastery of representation a way of mastering the world. And it's against this that impressionism and modernism would come into existence. So there, an impressionism and modernism would come into existence only after non-representational means of engaging with the world in art began to circulate from the East, the so-called East in the West in the 18th and 19th centuries. Why should the African mask, the Japanese print, Indian painting, Indian texts not be seen as a part of this history of formalism, which then on, on, on non-representational uh, uh, kind of rebellions against mastery, uh, wh why should it not be, a seen, a, not be seen as a, a background both to modern Indian uh, or African or um, Japanese practice as well as the history of those forms themselves? Why are they mentioned as curious kind of anecdotes, flirtations, which then become minor uh, charming facts in a history of formalism and of the non-representational, which then becomes largely a modern European history. That, that's, that's pretty strange. Um, the second thing is, and this is the last, absolute last thing that I want to say about Said, is his idea of pure knowledge, which he talks about right towards the beginning. He says, uh, you know, I was 
when I began to teach, I was, you know, teaching Wordsworth fell very much within the humanist paradigm of pedagogy. And then there were ideas of pure knowledge outside of which lay politics. So teaching Wordsworth was not the same thing at that time as say, studying the politics of China. Um, and then he's talking about assumptions to do in Western pedagogy to do with pure knowledge. I would say two things here. To use Wordsworth as an example of humanistic knowledge uh, misses the kind of angularity that literature has and continues to have uh, as, a, as a critique of humanism. And Wordsworth's connection there to non-Western texts allowing him to move beyond the human-centered worldview of the Renaissance is part of a history that needs to be part of our discussions of decolonization. Um, the idea of pure knowledge, let's use the word that Kant and uh, Matthew Arnold used on the one hand, and let's use the other word. The other, uh, sorry, both are the, both words are one word, disinterested. Disinterested falls within a binary. Yeah, it's either he's interested in football, uh, uh, sorry, interested fall, falls within a binary. He's interested in football, no, he's uninterested in football. Or he is a self-interested observer, or he's an interested observer, or he's a disinterested observer. But the, so disinterested in the way that Said uses the word in, uh, or, or gestures to the word when he says, talks about impartial or pure knowledge, is speaking about this uh, binary in which knowledge can claim to be objective as against interested. And he says there's no such thing as objective or impartial or disinterested knowledge. But disinterested in the way that Kant and um, Arnold use it is to kind of destroy this binary to make art both expression and not expression. Expression of the self and not expression of the self. It cannot be contained by this simple idea that, it's, that he's expressing or she is expressing herself. Uh, that, that binary is being dismantled. We're coming out of that binary in the way that the enlightenment doesn't allow. Now, again, that binary is being critiqued as part of a history of critiquing, critiquing that binary in various parts of that world, which Kant and Arnold are also beginning to get exposed to and get access to. So this is not a Western concept. It is a concept that belongs to the history of ideas. Again, uh, and I could go into that, we don't have the time for that, but again, this has to be part of the many histories we uncover when we think about, about something like decolonization. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Amit. Um, it uh, provides a very powerful way of, of, of thinking about um, decolonization in what I would call a, an intellectually creative way, intellectually productive way in a way that opens up uh, perspectives rather than closes them down. Um, I've got a number of questions and then I'll see whether there are questions coming through on the chat. And I think there is, there's time to take a few questions, isn't there? Um, yeah, we have about like 10, 15 minutes. We might yeah, have yeah. run a bit, but yeah. Um, so I, I'd like to go back to that very striking photograph that you showed and um, to the way in which you discussed it in terms of synecdoche and ask, well, there are a number of questions that I'd like to ask there. I mean, I, I think it makes the point about representation and the, dif the difference that you're, the way in which you're wanting to find a way uh, out of representation, out of all the discourse that attaches to the notion of representation. The, the question that I have to you is, 
is this. Um, when we respond to that uh, photograph, it reminds me of the famous distinction that Bart makes in his study of photographs between the punctum and the studium, um, where he says that the studium is what I'm expected to say about this photograph. It's what the culture leads me to say. The studium depends upon me noticing something that that, sorry, the punctum depends upon me responding to something that the, that's not in that, that what the culture expects me to say about the picture. Now, sorry, this is, I just want to take this two steps because I think it's quite important. The, there's a way of reading, I mean, I can see a way of responding or reading. It's, it isn't just a way of responding, it's a way of reading that picture, which says, the, which runs counter to what you're saying and, and says, you know, this is a picture of the downcast and the dispossessed uh, um, in revealing, you know, their poverty and arousing us to thoughts that this kind of thing should not be present in a just society, okay? You, so it becomes representative, not necessarily of Sikhdom, but it comes representative of, let's say, impoverishment or exploitation or oppression or outcastness or whatever it might be. Okay. And, and the other says, no, 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 there's, there's something else that's going on here, which is inviting us to, into a certain way of, as you said, imagining what's outside the picture as well as what's in it. And my question is simply this, are we talking here about formal properties within the picture I mean, it's a, it's a traditional question in a sense. Or are we talking about ways in which we read? Um, or both? I think, I think both. I think both. I think this, this picture is, is, a, uh, is a wonderful picture uh, uh, in the way it sort of frames its subject and, and um, makes us encounter it or them. So um, we encounter them uh, in, in a way in which I think uh, new realities, new possibilities uh, are presented to us uh, when when we think of this family in the underground in, in 1940, in the London underground in 1940. Uh, there are other pictures side by side of English people. Those are also marvelous pictures in the underground, uh, sleeping uh, or lying down on the tracks and on the platform, uh, very crowded next to each other. They're just lying flat, trying to get some rest. Those two are marvelous. I mean, and they're more than representative or informative about that time. There's something about those pictures that is asking us to enter history and to, in, by, to do so by imagining it, not by knowing it already. Um, when I, but of course, I mean, we may not read it in that way, or we may lose the capacity to encounter it in that way. Um, all the comments that I saw for that picture, which I showed you on, on that website from which I got it, uh, had to do with exactly the kind of response that you were talking about, uh, to do with downcast Sikhs or, or even the, the bad Sikhs. Sikhs are a problem these days. There were those comments as well. Th th those are the two sides of, of that kind of, uh, which just looks at it as information as, and is unable to, uh, to discover, to see, uh, to use Berger's word, to see, you know, uh, and and um, let me uh, finish uh, replying to your question by quickly telling you how, where, when I first encountered that picture. I think it was in the early nineties uh, in a in a channel for documentary made by the writer Ian Sinclair along with the filmmaker Chris Pettit, uh, and 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 he was talking about. London as usual and, and, and sharing with us certain pictures which he said for him were part of a surreal history of London. I mean, whether, you're, whether or not you like the word surreal, I suppose 
He just means unfamiliar or strange. Although these, all of these things are familiar, you know, that they, they are not in any conventional sense uh, outlandish. He showed us this picture. He showed us a, an X-ray of of a toy, tiny toy plastic bicycle stuck in a child's throat from that time. He said it was one of the great photo, surreal photographs, surrealist photographs of, of Britain, in Britain of, of that time. And the third was from closer to his time, was from the 80s maybe. I don't know if you remember, uh, John, uh, and if they still exist, but there was a time when Indian restaurants used to take pictures of of the people who had gathered there to eat at the tables and pin up those pictures later for whom I don't know. But you'd see pictures of people in a party or, or a gathering who had been to that restaurant previously uh, displayed on, on, on a kind of little board. So he showed us some of those pictures and they all for him formed a kind of map for this strange pictorial history. Um, if we were looking at it in terms of adding things up according to uh, demography or some idea of justice or fairness, then we then I, I don't think we would discover these conjunctions, or we would in fact notice the Sikh family. To see him, to see them only as information is not to notice them actually, unfortunately not to notice who they are. Is um, oh, just a re reminder to people who are listening in, you can ask questions through the chat function if you want to, to ask a question of Annet. Um, so please do that perhaps rather than the Q and A function. Um, can I press you just a bit more? I mean, because this is, this is a very important issue. What is, what are the, do you have a sense of what it, of what the properties of noticing are? I mean, just to notice rather than, is it, it's noticing is something distinct from knowing, isn't it? Is it? Uh, yeah, it, it, yes, it is. And it, it leads to a different form of knowing, I think, in the, in the sense that it, 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 noticing is always an, an uh, encounter with a, uh, with a history. I think that, that there are, some questions in Q and A, but maybe they're also been transferred to chat. No, they're coming through now. Um, uh, I, I think I think you you uh, you sort of access history anew by noticing. Otherwise, history is what's already there, the way you've been told to think about it. You uh, you you uh, encounter it anew through noticing, or uh, you know, with music, where with in my kind of experience with mishearing, which is also kind of noticing, you know, like when I began to hear uh, the riff to Clapton's Leila in the Rag Tori, I, I would, I would say that that is a, a way of um, encountering something historical uh, anew. Right. Thank, thank you. I'm going to take some uh, questions now from chat, I think. Um, there's a number of things coming through. There. Sorry, there, there was a, a one question which took up the issue of disinterestedness um, and about Arnold's uh, reading of the Gita. Yeah, uh, because you were you were you were uh, hinting at that in what you were saying, um, and I think the question is in part an invitation for you to say more about that. <laughs> okay. Um... Uh, I'll just take a few minutes. Uh, maybe I can take the other questions and as well and, and take them because uh, yeah, and I'm, we're sure. running out of time. So uh, I can address that question along with the other ones. Okay, so there's a question about the link between the drive for decolonization and that drive which Aditya Chakraborty discussed regarding the narrowing abundance of cultural identities. Um, do they bear, both bear the same indelible fingerprints of power, of gentrification, of Notting Hill? That's a, a, another question. Um, and, um, but I, I'm afraid that my, I can't identify some of the questions because they're being 
Ah, yeah. oh, wait a minute. Let me see if I can get it back. Yeah, so there's the question about the Gita. There's the question, what is the link between the bubble you've talked about at the beginning and this emphasis on seeing and decolonization? Um, another, so there are, there are some very good questions there, I think that would be worth okay. uh, your response to. But okay, let, let me try and answer these two questions. And uh, um, the, the ones you mentioned at the end. Um, yeah. If there are others, maybe I can take them at some other uh, other point. Um, but but um, about the about Arnold reading the Gita, yes, uh, Arnold was a um, was reading the Gita as a as as a poetic text, as a secular text, with with uh, with huge interest. Uh, and um, I think in the maybe in the eighteen fifties. And then he mentions it in his uh, essay on literature. My mind's gone blank now uh, as to dates. Um, but 1870s, he begins to talk about literary language and critical language. And it, it's in the, le and the function of criticism. Is, is that the one in, in the present time? I'm not sure it's in there. Um, I can't recall it myself, but. Uh, he doesn't mention the Gita by name, he's mentioned it in other places, but he mentioned mm -hmm. the Indian Yogi. So he's referring there to the Gita because that's the main text that he's reading. It becomes available in, in the West, firstly through Charles Wilkins's uh, translation in 1785, maybe? It, 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 I, I'm guessing. Uh, yeah, I think it's 1785. So, uh, uh, the Gita proposes a form of, uh, of the Gita itself is a, it is a poetic text. It's it's a text of of stasis. You know things are being said in it, but there is no movement, narrative movement as such in it as there is in the text it's embedded in, which is the Mahabharata, where there is a great deal of wonderful narrative movement. Um, so the Gita is a is a peculiar departure, um, and and. Um, and it speaks in, 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 in poetic paradoxes. It uses those paradoxes to, to move forward without moving forward, which is what stasis is in this, in this uh, context. Um, so you move forward without actually learning anything because at the end of the beginning, you don't know exactly what, what, what information you've got, unlike the Mahabharata, where you know uh, a great deal more about those people by the time you come to the end of the Mahabharata. With the Gita, you don't know uh, uh, what you've learned that's more than what you found out in the first couple of verses. Um, and, and, and Arnold is taking all this in as many other people are, and they're of course reading Buddhist texts and Gita itself owes something to Buddhism. Uh, you know, it's itself incorporated arguments from Buddhism to reject the Vedas, for instance. Uh, and, and that kind of uh, um, ritualistic obeisance either to the word or, or to some idea. It's saying that's, that's not the way to go. And it's proposing a form of action which is also disinterested. It's, it's, it's saying act without thinking of the fruit of action. And, 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 and this kind of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, idea uh, uh, is, is, is actually quite weird. It, it, it must have flummoxed Arjun, whom he was speaking to, uh, and we don't know whether he, it, 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 it was useful to him, and it's uh, certainly bewildering as an idea, except when translated into uh, the idea of the, the creative or, or spiritual act, uh, a discipline where you do something without, uh, without kind of thinking about or it being dependent on an idea of the outcome. And for, for Kant, I think Kant must have come across this text because he makes this his change in his critique of pure reason and comes up with this idea to do with disinterestedness and, and beauty uh, and, and, and the aesthetic in 1790, five years after the Gita begins to be circulated. And he also speaks in these paradoxes. And, um, and he comes up with this paradox himself to do with 
aesthetic activity called, he calls it uh, purposeful purposelessness, which, which goes back to, to Krishna's advice to Arjun. Um, and, and, and then this is translated in the critical domain by, by Arnold. So he, he, breaks down the, he breaks down the binary. He's, he's not saying that uh, criticism must be an impartial view of what's good in a, in a work or bad in a work. It has to be disinterested, but in a different sense. It, it, it must uh, partake of the work, but in a non-instrumental way, according, according to the way we generally understand knowledge. So, so it's a radical departure and mm. a, a critique of enlightenment ways of thinking about knowledge. He's positing criticism and literature as another form of knowledge from the way the enlightenment conceives of knowledge. It's important to see these congruences as we decolonize. Now the question of the bubble, what's the connection with the bubble? Uh, and I'll end with this one. Uh, the, the, the bubble is Notting Hill. Just to, just to kind of go back to the film, the bubble, Notting Hill claims to be England. Notting Hill claims to be the world. You know, I'm talking about the film. You think this is what the world should be like? You think this is England? Uh, and, uh, and it claims to do that by a particular kind of representation. Now, then when you look at it and then you think, no, but, but, but the representation isn't accurate. I need, need to put in some people from other ethnicities over there. The representation never noticed what it was representing in, on the way to creating that bubble, which became the world. Um, the, 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 the solution to breaking the bubble is not to represent more accurately, but to actually notice both the people who are being represented, look at them, notice them for the first time. You, nobody has seen them, the filmmaker hasn't seen them, and also the people who are actually there, but are not being noticed. That's the person, the, 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 the group of women in the burqas, uh, the, 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 the Middle Eastern man uh, with, in the shop over there, various other people. Um, they, they cannot be just brought in through an act of addition and representation. They actually have to be seen for us to see and partake of their histories. Seen in, at a certain moment. It is about that moment of seeing, which the photograph captures. It captures again and again that moment of the encounter of seeing. I think I should stop here because... Um, yes. Well. Again, um, and on behalf of everybody, Amit, thank you so much. I think thank you. you've outlined how um, decolonization could, as I said earlier, become a productive force and, um, in, an, and in a way that I haven't heard so fully articulated before. So uh, thank you very much for that. And five minute break now, and then we start again. So, okay. Thanks. Thanks. Devoshi, nice to see you. Hi, so good to see you. I'm finally feeling excited about my talk. It was so invigorating to hear the first two papers. Great. Um, I'm going to actually quickly uh, just try and check because I have a few video clips. So yeah. I just want to see if they are sharing and I'm going to try Shubhi Sharkar's uh, hack for how to just show a small window. Let me see. Share screen. That that's coming uh, on the screen screen quite clearly. Do you just see the black box, or do you see all the entire apparatus of the PowerPoint? I see the apparatus. Yeah, um, I see. The, uh, yeah. Okay, so 
if I do this, um, begin slideshow. Now do you just see the black slide? No, I don't. Uh, do you want to? My wife is saying, do you want to uh, try an option called begin slideshow? Is there? Uh, some I might just go with my usual format. Okay. And not use. Um, okay, slideshow setup speaker. Okay. Share screen. Um, there it is. That's fine. Okay, so I just want to check if videos are playing from inside the slideshow. Is this playing? Yeah, it's uh, it's not playing as yet, but I can see it. I can see an image. Yeah, now it's playing. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, that's a huge relief. It means I don't have to toggle across videos and PowerPoint. Okay, thank you. Great. See you in a couple of minutes. See you, yes. Um, Arjot or Mukund? Hi, Mukund. Hello. Mukund, uh, I think Sumana is not getting audio and video options. Um, in fact, I don't even see where she is. Uh, yes, uh, she just called me. I'm, uh, let's see. Okay. I think she's not on the panel, I think, right now. Can you tell her to get onto the panel? Yes, I'll, I'll tell 
Thank you. We joined from the, I think, the Oh, she is the panelist. I gave her the panelist right now. Okay. Hi, Shimona. It's good to meet you. At last, yeah. <laughs> Where's the toddler? Oh, I, that, that was the Aditya's message that you were responding to. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's a cat here and I have to maybe actually bribe the cat so that it doesn't show up during my talk. So th thanks for reminding me. Let me take care of my toddler. One second. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think you can start if you wish. I mean, yep. Yeah. Thank you. Why is it that? Okay, I think I have. I think you're uh, visible to the audience. Okay. Once there was she's back. I think you'll have to unmute your mic. Thank you. So Mukund, you'll help me with the Q&A just in case I miss something, right Mukund and Harjot, both of you? Yes, sure. Yeah, thank you Mukund. The literary activism symposiums have, at least in my understanding, tried to create a space of interaction and engagement between the now institutionally differentiated categories of the theoretician and the practitioner. Even as a handful of people are trying to do this in say writing or the arts, there's almost no such space for cinema, particularly in India. In the last two symposiums, the filmmakers Gurvinder Singh and Anurag Kashyap have discussed their work. Gurvinder Singh about how his films kept time and how that was again storytelling, the title of that particular symposium. And Anurag Kashyap about the mark of failures and significantly also his failings in his cinema. Energizing and enlightening as their talks were, it also seemed necessary and I would say urgently necessary to listen to someone from the other side in a way we rarely get to in India, a practitioner, by which I mean an insider to the intestines of what went into the making of the film, a practitioner who was now looking at films with a variety of knowledge systems. There could be no better person than Devoshi Mukherjee to do this. I began reading her book, Bombay Hustle, making movies in a colonial city soon after it was published last year. It was recommended to me by two grad students. Grad students almost always have better book suggestions than the 10 best book lists in the newspapers. I was immediately struck by her approach. What academia will call method, it's been called transdisciplinary by her publisher, for want of a better word, it's not her fault, of course. I began sharing excerpts of the book with students and discussed with them with hope and joy how it was possible to transform the archive into something that's alive and living as Devoshri had done. He calls it Cine Ecology, and I'm hoping she will talk about it during her talk or later. Devoshri Mukherjee, before I forget to introduce her, is a film historian and media theorist. Trained as a filmmaker, she worked in Bombay's film and television industries 
from 2004 to 2007 on projects such as the film Omkara. Devushree's assistant professor at the Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies at Columbia University and is author of the book that I just mentioned, Bombay Hustle, Making Movies in a Colonial City. It was published last year. The title of Devushree's talk is Cinema and Its Others, Decolonizing the Human. And she'll be sharing with us what it means to decolonize the category human and how the post-human turn might help us to, and these are her words, decenter the human as the presiding figure of anthropogenic planetary devastation. She argues for a shift from decentering to decolonizing, and she'll be discussing two films, Anamika Huxer's Taking the Horse to Eat Jalebis and Abhishek Chaube's Son Chiria. Over to you, Devasri, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Umona, for that warm introduction. Uh, can you hear me? Um, I, I have to admit, I mean, I have to begin with a note of thanks, first of all, to Amit Chaudhary for, um, for inviting me to this very, very, I think, important conversation. And I was a bit surprised by the invitation, but now, now it's all becoming clear. But um, perhaps I think, fortunately or unfortunately, I'm not discussing my book today. I actually took up this call to think through some things that I'm currently reading and watching and muddling through. And I thought it would be um, an interesting opportunity to do that along with all of you today. And I have to say that I also feel uh, uh, very honored to be speaking today uh, at Ashoka University, uh, especially at a time that's a very difficult time in the lives of universities across India and the United States. So let me begin. Um, I'm just going to keep the um, a kind of a slideshow on through the presentation. Um, let me first try that. Okay, can you see this? Okay, so I've been thinking a lot about what it means to be human. Perhaps all of us have. The pandemic has forced us all to confront our mortality and also what it means to be in community with one another, precisely because we have been compelled to be so apart. Antonio Gramsci, a thinker so pivotal to post-colonial studies from South Asia, reminds us that, and I quote, the starting point of critical elaboration is knowing thyself as a product of historical processes to date, which have deposited in you an infinity of traces without leaving an inventory. Therefore, it is imperative at the outset to compile such an inventory. That's the end of the quote. So how do we know ourselves to be human? This question is at the heart of much decolonial thought. What are the mechanisms of knowledge that have enabled some humans to claim mastery over the world, to assert dominion over nature, to subjugate other human and non-human beings to their will and instrumental reason. Am I not human is a question that continually recurs for those who feel forsaken by euphoric proclamations of human progress. Are they not human is another question that reverberates for those who are discomfited by the logic of the greater good. In recent years, the humanities and social sciences have seen a distinct shift towards what is called the post-human turn. From early feminist excitement about the possibilities of a human machine hybrid, the cyborg, for example, in the 1980s, we have moved towards a more cautious thinking with objects and things. The so-called new materialisms of today are defined by the urgent and impending horizon of climate emergencies and planetary devastation. The driving idea here is that enlightenment conceptions of man as a sovereign rational subject have enabled a hierarchical extractive relationship between man and nature. And hence the argument goes that we must restore subjectivity to that which we deem object. We must decenter the human from the humanities is the call of the 21st century academy. So far, so good. Now, the thing that rankles me 
is the lingering coloniality in much of this scholarship. In our eagerness to de-center the human, aren't we assuming again that the human is a fixed ontological category that stands on one side of the world of things, right, while things stand on the other? And many have also pointed out that the project of decentering under the sign of the Anthropocene stands the risk of reinscribing the centrality of man. What I want to suggest today is that the urgent task is not so much to decenter the human, but to decolonize this category, which once again presumes to speak to the universal modern human subject. Sylvia Winter, writing from the perspective of feminist black studies, has consistently reminded us that the dominant and commonsensical usage of the term human actually refers to man with a capital M, a modern, secular, and Western vision of the human that rests on racialized hierarchies. The category man falsely separates full humans from not quite humans and non-humans on the basis of biology and economics. This conception of man prevents us from seeing humanness as differentiated rather than available to a select few and prevents us thus from seeing ourselves as continuous with many others in shared and often unshareable modes of life. So rather than decenter man in favor of things, can we not do the decolonial work of bringing into view the differentiated genres of human that have also been displaced and subjugated under the aegis of man? As I ask in my new book, can we then think of the differential depletion of humans alongside planetary extinction? And so if we're trying to think today of ways of being decolonial, we must start here with an interrogation of the category human. And then to seek out alternative modes or genres, as Sylvia Winter would say, of being human. Look to cultural texts and archival subtexts, everyday practices and mundane environments for these genres that elude the dominant vision of man. This is a creative and intellectual project that opens out onto a life of activism and praxis. In today's talk, I join a shared project initiated by scholars who are thinking very deeply about how to unsettle the epistemic projects of modernity, where modernity is fundamentally implicated with colonial violence. Coloniality and modernity are thus thought together in a hyphenated form as a perverse and originary coupling. Drawing on decolonial theory developed in Latin America in the 1990s and inspired by a rich oeuvre of anti-colonial and anti-racist thought that can be grouped under the rubric of black studies, I will offer some cinematic insights on how to think against the colonial training of our minds. The separation of human from non-human, the hierarchization of some humans above others rests on processes of abstraction linearity and universality. What is disallowed within this episteme is particularity, embodiment, and most crucially, relationality. And this is something I think I've been hearing in both our, uh, our talks of, of today. Now, as I was preparing my thoughts for today, um, a Hindi word of recent coinage struck me as particularly resonant to describe what could be a decolonial conception of the human. And that word is Andolan Jeevi. It's a beautiful word. No, really. It means one whose life is a constant struggle or one for whom agitation is a key register of life. Instead of using the word to punitively mark out certain individuals, as was the intention with which the word made its parliamentary debut, it might be more interesting to think of the human as one that must continually struggle, agitate, protest against the conditions of life, not only for oneself, but for a larger anonymous collective of fellow beings. The term jeev is of central importance here, and it signifies a living thing, a life force, that which is engaged in the act of living. And here life is clearly not a fixed ontology, but a processual category. Life is the practice of living. And adding the term andolan as a prefix to the living is to acknowledge that living is a constant struggle. It is marked by its ongoingness and it is a struggle undertaken with others. 
as a being that is different from the buddhi jeevi or the intellectual the andolan jeevi helps us rethink who it is that can occupy the space of politics and public expression surely the intellectual and the struggling community of the living can and must work together now if cultural images texts and sounds are forms of knowledge production then cinema has always been imbricated in processes of coloniality and i can talk more about this in the discussion later but at the same time film photography music have also been powerful sites for launching anti colonial anti racist and feminist critiques my aim today is not to provide a prescriptive set of films that illustrate decoloniality many of you are no doubt familiar with the canon of films and filmmakers who represent what we may call cinematic activism specifically decolonial filmmaking the battle of algiers by pontecorvo from 1966 the hour of the furnaces battle of chile these are a handful of examples that you're all i'm sure familiar with and we could add here the ajit prop pedagogical documentary films of anand patwardhan and some of the classics of self reflexive modernist filmmaking in the art cinema and the parallel tradition mrinal sen's calcutta trilogy john abraham's amma aryan the list is substantial and significant while i absolutely agree that these films and filmmakers do the vital work of anti establishment critique i would also like to see a more promiscuous mode of thinking with cinema at large one that is able to think with popular cinema for example or films that resist classification altogether films in which the political or the activist imagination is not so very clearly announced so today i want to spend some time discussing two fairly recent films that i watched during the pandemic a pandemic that is also ongoing abhishek chobe's son chiria which stars well known actors of bollywood including the nationally mourned actor sushant singh rajput and anamika haksar's ghore ko jalebi khilane le ja riya hu taking the horse to eat jalebis which also brings together a cast of veteran actors alongside amateur actors to tell a surreal but very viscerally grounded story about dreams nightmares and survival i watched anamika haksar's film on my computer at home and that context is significant it is important to consider that we live today in a world of continual image delivery those of us at least that have easy access to online content and streaming platforms we're constantly moving between digital images sounds and affect that inform us about daily news or entertain us in our attempts to enliven the work from home routine and so i watched huxer's film within a media environment where images of migrant workers walking home had created a narrative impasse in the pr story of india's stern and successful nationwide lockdown a story of celebratory chants and clanging steel utensils that was being rapidly circulated on whatsapp now sometime during the weeks when i was falling asleep to and waking up to these images and videos i encountered huxer's film here was a fundamentally unclassifiable work of cinema and i quote here from lalita gopalan's new book where she begins with a discussion of the film calling it unclassifiable this is a cinema that directly plunges the viewer into the world of wage labor and informal street ecologies the film begins with a title card that declares that the film is culled from interviews and dreams of pickpockets street vendors small scale factory workers daily wage earners domestic workers loaders rickshaw pullers and many others laboring in the city of shah jahanabad old delhi we then get the opening credit of the production company gutterati films and you 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 start to kind of um develop an anticipation of what's to come but from here we launch into a disturbingly immersive view of the lives of others with irreverent flights into animation fantasy humor and violence the film is intimate and visceral deeply particularized in shah jahanabad but it also defamiliarizes the city so i want to play here the opening sequence of the film to give you a taste of some of the sensorial shocks that are delivered by the film's uh, genre mixing 
And I hope this works out. Okay, so I'm sorry if there was a bit of a, a lag. I think this is just a function of our Zoom streaming possibilities. So I just want to kind of go over what we just looked at. The first image that we see is of a choked drain in the back alleys of Delhi's old city. And the first words we hear are gendered insults in women's voices, voices that are strangely electronic and distorted. The camera tries to give us a spatial orientation as we glide above the sleeping bodies of day laborers, exposed to the camera, our watching eyes, and the ceaseless city traffic that is present through the sounds. And then a dream of divine beneficence collides with a dream of proletarian awakening as the goddess Saraswati is nudged out by the socialist red flag while a chorus of voices sing the international in Hindi. While our protagonists dream different dreams of the future, there is no escape for the viewer who was rapidly drawn into a polyphonous dream world in which um, we access the fleeting thoughts and the contradictory desires of a multiplicity of precarious lives. Are these Andolan Jeevis? I ask under my breath. The film doesn't just stop at depictions of dreams that happen when the body is asleep at night. There are daydreams with eyes wide open. For example, there is an early scene in which, sorry. There is an early scene in which a wage worker um, 
is so affronted by the casual violence of a godown owner that he responds to this violence with a dream of reversal the sate or the contractor that you see over here who is a particularly abusive man transforms into a lizard man trapped in a vessel of his own making shouting his abuses into a sealed environment that dehumanizes him even as he seeks to dehumanize his employees some visions are recurring memories of the past re-narrativized into uncanny hallucinations sleeping waking dreaming breathing memories of migration and flight are encoded here flight from floods and starvation and futures that seem so tenuous that they dissolve if you look at the horizon for too long dreaming and storytelling are powerful tools of survival in this film and the film immerses us in stories of daily dehumanization alongside efforts constant efforts at individuation and i'd like to show another short clip here मैं सपने में अमीर हूँ तालाब के किनारे मैं अपना धन दान दे रहा हूँ किसी को कपड़े किसी को पैसे किसी को घर लेकिन लेने वाले गायब हो जाते हैं so in the interest of time i'll stop here but the the film is is a pretty much a montage of many such dreams which blur into nightmares um that constant constantly collide against each other and we're given a sense of this place right of what shah jahan abad is if it's a space that's comprised of multiple desires dreams um and memories and i think a question that stays with you once you once you've done watching the film is who is to say that this dream world is not a real place or that our real world is not exactly this a whirlpool of incommensurable visions and nightmares that are constantly encountering each other taking the horse to eat jalebis doesn't offer us any easy vision of emancipation nor is it about spectacles of suffering rather it brings into view the many interconnected histories that define us and our place in the world um now sorry now this book is something that i've been reading uh, this past week and it's been very useful for me here Julieta Singh zooms in on mastery as the discursive and the material infrastructure of colonialism. She cautions us that in our efforts towards liberation, we must not and cannot adopt the same discourses of mastery. Anti-colonial movements or decolonial struggles are doomed if they persist in practices of mastery, be they corporeal, linguistic or intellectual. In order to lo loosen the hold of mastery, Singh says, we must learn to read for it if we can do so work such as anamika haksar while in no way offering guidelines for a prescriptive future politics ask us instead to open ourselves to reimagining ways of relating to each other to others that are human non human and inhuman 
to which even if we disavow them, we are mutually bound. Now, the work of decoloniality is more than the historical process of decolonization. In fact, it transcends the historical time of colonialism and now properly addresses the age of nationalism. It is in the name of nationalism, as we know, that some of the most extractive and non-egalitarian policies and processes have been enforced in both the countries that I'm currently straddling, right, India and the United States, consolidating older categories of human classification and the marginalization of populations. Post-colonial cinemas from India have responded with vigor to these questions, and we might do well to pay heed to some recurring cinematic figures that appear in these cinemas, figures such as the bandit and the bagi, the tapori and the sex worker, the ghost and the churel, the witch, who call attention to the failed promises of the modern nation state. These figures shout to us from the margins of filmic narratives, as well as the commercial centers of film economies, refusing to be silenced while also speaking in tongues that are not readily audible. So here I want to turn to the film Son Chiria, which was also released in 2019. The film reconfigures the colonialist genre of the Western to implicitly lay bare the everyday and the spectacular violence of the nation state. Historically, the Western is a border marking genre with a territorial logic, spatially delimiting zones of freedom and human possibility in the frontier lands of the settler colonial project crafting a pulp origin narrative for the United States of America. Abhishek Chaube draws on the stylistic panache of the Western genre as it was reconfigured in the 1960s and 70s, often in ways that are now considered revisionist or even anti-Western in their ideology. The formal features of the classics of this reprised Western lend themselves beautifully to stories set in the badlands of India the arid Chambal Valley with its own legendary and notorious era of bandits and outlaws. Now the bandit in Soncheria is a complex figure, beleaguered and desperate, cursed and morally repentant, caught between a life of violence and privation on one hand and the only other possibility being surrendered to the state on the other. And the film is set in 1975. It opens with a weary and dusty band of decoits confronted with a dead snake blocking their path. And this is the first shot of the film. The leader of the group, Man Singh, played by Manoj Bajpai, invokes the mother goddess and they move ahead. But they're unable to really move on. Soon after, one of the gang members, played by Sushan Singh Rajput, sees an apparition in a river. A little girl's phantom body seems to float past as he washes his face in the river. It turns out that this same apparition is haunting uh, the gang leader, Man Singh, as well. And so the first sustained conversation in the film, and this is a film with very uh, sparse dialogue, the first conversation is about fear and death. So Shan Singh believes that the dead snake was cursed and that they have a curse that is following them. And soon after this, we are introduced to another spectral figure, another female figure, the legendary Fulan Devi. Uh, and this is uh, the actor that plays Fulan in the film. A group of dominant caste hawkers wants the gang to get Fulan off their backs. She has become a monstrous avenging specter on a mission to punish the men who brutalized her using all the social tools of caste and gender violence. There seems to be no real recourse for Fulan via the legal apparatus of the state, given the structural complicities of the police. And so both Fulan Devi and her enemies seek recourse in the fugitive apparatus of banditry. And we start to realize that this group might actually be in crisis. They are well past their glory days. Broke and desperate for money and munitions, they set off to loot a wedding party. The film now introduces another female specter, Indira Gandhi. Now, um, I, I'm not going to play this sequence, but basically we see we're introduced to the robbery of the wedding party sequence through the point of view of this little boy who's playing with a kind of a paper wheel with, the, uh, with an image of Indira Gandhi at the center. And as the gang enters into the village, 
that visual is overlaid with uh, the sound um, of a radio announcement where we hear Indira Gandhi's voice on the radio as she announces the declaration of emergency. And now after this, um, this which is, it's a, it's a failed um, attempt at robbery, the curse that was so um, feared fulfills its mission. The leader of the gang is killed in an encounter here with the STF. And a particularly vengeful police officer hangs his corpse up and parades it. <coughs> and parades it um, uh, through the village with many other corpses of bandits laden on a truck. Now two junior constables are watching this degrading spectacle and one exclaims aloud, this is dehumanizing. Why must a wretched corpse be treated thus? After all, he says, Man Singh is a human. Now this appeal to humanity of the corpse is quickly deflated when the next sentence is, Man Singh is a Thakur. And this is how the film exposes the regimes of thought under which humanity is not a shareable category, but conditionally granted to some. Caste is the currency of this world and a central concern of the film which characterizes our ensemble of protagonists, their motivations and their values, um, inscribing the very landscape of the Chambal Valley with the divisions between those who can be touched and those who are rendered untouchable. In foregrounding caste as the structuring reality of this world, Son Chiria confirms that the enlightenment conception of man must be thought alongside and with a Brahminical conception of man. We, the post-colonial subjects of independent India, part of the global South and proud claimants of the global stage cannot absolve ourselves of our own narratives of mastery, our own naturalized separations of the human and the less than human. Calls to decolonize cannot be restricted to imperial outsiders and assorted foreigners. And both films that I discussed today confront the colonialist and caste structures of modern India from the inside. And here, the film is joined by its final female specters, or rather fugitives. The gang has to take on a young Thakur woman who is fleeing her village with a child in tow. The little girl has been raped, and the woman played by Bhumi Pirnikar is desperately trying to get her to a hospital. The gang takes them in out of an honor code, which is to protect members of their own caste. And this, uh, the adult woman um, is, is also a Thakur. But the child, as it is soon discovered, has her Dalit identity branded on her arm. Again, there is no escape. Son Chiria deftly picks apart the tight coils between different forms of fugitivity marked by caste, gender, class, and religion using the apparatus of myth and legend, that which has been called unreason in the bourgeois urban imagination. Dead snakes serve as ominous messengers here and dead girls return as ghostly specters, reminders that the past cannot be repressed for long. The oral specter of Indira Gandhi, resurrected from a radio announcement, reminds us of the cyclical nature of history, how 1975 and 2019 may be closer than one might think. If we abandon, a linear view of historical progress. The recursive logics of history, where the ruins of the past continually pile up behind us, even as the angel of history flies into the future, is underlined in one of the recurring um, sayings or statements, uh, aphorisms in the film, which is, the snake eats the rat and the vulture eats the snake. That's the way of the world, so say the wise men. Now, historical recursivity is boldly named as cruelty here, a cruelty that is justified by the wise men of the world, those who benefit from a Darwinian view of survival of the fittest. But in the ethical vision of the film, it is not the fittest who survive. In fact, and I'm sorry for the spoiler, but the fittest consume each other in a mindless scramble for power and mastery. It is those who are deemed the weakest that actually survive the journey. So I just want to play now the title song of the film. I'm sorry I don't have a subtitle version, but basically the song speaks of a magical golden bird. 
the son cherry of the title desired by all but utterly elusive the tired group which is no longer a gang anymore as much as an ensemble of depleted desperate lives finds a moment of quiet on a boat in the middle of the chambal river the woman tells the story of how she met the little girl and how she named her son cherrya or a golden bird it is a song of mourning but also a song of magic it articulates many forms of indigenous uh, local situated expression that offer a toolkit for survival and again here i want to underline that struggles for survival form a genre of resistance that exceeds the lexicon of agency as heroic action so again a need perhaps to rethink um our notions of agency so i'm just playing the opening stanza of the film to give you a sense of also how the landscape has been shot <laughs> Okay, um, and that song is sung by Rekha Bhardwaj. Now, what does it mean to make a girl into a bird? This is obviously a mythologizing operation, and the mythic is the narrative genre, narrative genre par excellence for origin stories, for stories of who we are and where we come from. In choosing the genre of the western, Son Chiriya tells us a disturbing origin story, one in which we are all implicated. yet it doesn't pretend to speak for all humanity its affective decoloniality lies in being obstinately specific grounded in a bundelkhandi dialect that refuses to make concessions through translation in this song we also see the production of what might be called an aesthesis of the local the camera plays with scale and landscape situating the human ensemble within an environment that is not merely a backdrop river sky birds light hills dust people boat blood they all form a tenuous but vital ecological assemblage one that cannot be replicated in any other place in any other time situated struggles arise out of particular geographies and temporalities the harshness of this arid landscape the life giving waters that also carry ghosts and as you will soon see hungry crocodiles are inextricable from the human and the more than human as signified by constant invocations of the mother goddess jay bhavani and worship of bhavani uh, constantly figure in the film in the song we are seeing a temporary moment of co becoming what we might otherwise call collectivities or communities something ephemeral but real this ephemerality is significant because the iconography of both veers generally towards a certain futurism with a grand destiny awaiting the future of man in a long line from noah's ark to sci-fi dreams of rebirth and i was thinking here of the film children of men but here i find no such reproductive futurism a fugitive woman and a damaged child broken men with broken bodies where could they be headed as the film spirals towards tragedy and the gang rapidly disintegrates a new and surprising group of solidarities converge around the soncheria the secret heart of um the film and the open wound of india's post colonial democracy the film ends with the police piling up dead bodies of bandits as phulan devi surrenders only the woman and the child that we have just seen survive so to wrap up fugitivity is the mode of survival for those who have been cast outside the realm of the human as somehow less than human their filmic trajectory cannot end with the attainment of some full blooded humanness as that is an abstraction that cannot be reached rather they strive for other things other modes of humanness such as healing a temporary end to hunger and pain delight in a brightly colored piece of candy even a moment of rest against a splendid sunset Alexander Vahelier and I've shown you an image from his book insists that we do not understand this as bare life but as fleshly alterities of human being minuscule movements glimmers of hope interrupted dreams of freedom found in those spaces that are deemed devoid of full human life spaces such as these desperate ravines a prison lockup a garbage dump 
a cold countertop in an illegal abortion clinic. These are some everyday spaces of fugitivity. Now, both the films that I have dis um, discussed today refuse any prescriptive visions of resistance or happy solutions. They dwell in the imaginative impasse, the narrative euphoria, and they compel us to dwell in these fugitive spaces as well. Both films are committed to embodiment, the fleshly nature of life and of thought. Histories of bodily violence and deprivation form the grounds for tactics of survival and struggle. Both the films also move away from narratives that follow a single protagonist and give us ensemble casts in which individual characters get fluctuating narrative and visual weight. While one film is marked by a frenzied montage of images and sounds, the other deliberately slows down what is a familiar frenzy of the action film. I have chosen to think with them today because they give us glimpses of modes of relational being, human becoming, that may not be fully legible or graspable as human, at least not yet. And together, both the films also help us think beyond the boundaries of the urban and the rural or the hinterland, where human domination and refusals of domination are ongoing and connected. The Hindi or the Bengali phrase that is most commonly used to refer to living things is the compound phrase Jeev Jantu, which brings the non-human animal into an imagination of what constitutes the world of the living. It opens up a world where climate activists can clearly see the entanglements between forests, rivers, cities, air, and livelihood. In opening and closing my talk today with the word Amdolan Jeevi, I didn't mean to invoke the specter of someone that we might rather wish away, but I sought to reimagine the possibility of this word and rescue it from a colonialist imagination of a police state where acts of collective solidarity are in, they are incapable of being understood outside the logics of instrumental and cynical individualism. The category of human has been unstable from the outset. Hegemonically designed to create artificial divisions between people and other people, it was coded from the outset with its own breakdown. And again, to return to Sylvia Winter at the end, I'd just like to make a modest suggestion that being human might actually be simply a praxis. And here all those who choose to protest against the limitations of the man-made world offer us very important lessons for how to be and become human, which is vital for the future of this planet. Thank you. Thank you, Devasri. Uh, that was really wonderful. And I was thinking of the many films that I have watched over the last two years that kind of illustrate what you are thinking. And I'll come to uh, one of those examples, which has become a favorite of mine, Pratik Vatsa's film, uh, but a little later. Um, the first is because you mentioned the Western and the subversion of the Western. Uh, I was thinking of something that is almost a pet peeve of mine. Um, I was reading reviews of Soncheria and uh, I wanted to ask you something that bothers me about Indian film critics and Indian literary critics or literary reviewers as well. It is the, about slowness. I mean, uh, they diagnosed it in Satyajit Ray, they diagnosed it in Money Call, and all the reviews that I have read from Anupama Chopra to even those I like, seem to be united in ascribing slowness and as if it were a defect of the film, Turbishet Chauve. So do you think of this, because the experience of time is so utterly human, I think one of the things that makes us human is this inhuman construction of time. So do you think of this in terms of decoloniality as well, this uh, relationship with time and the human? That's a great question. Um, I think in a film like this, which is very self-consciously, the Soncharya, which is very self-consciously trying to work within and against the genre of the Western and the Western as a film premised on action. Um, in this film, slowness becomes, becomes a kind of a primary uh, vehicle for that contestation, right? Of the, the logics of the Western film. So I think in this film, working with genre 
slowness is definitely um, doing that that work. Slowness is also something that I think, um, while seen as a defect by by many mainstream film critics, is also overly celebrated by those that celebrate art cinema. So the the marker of a festival film, so to say is slowness. You recognize immediately that you're sitting in an auditorium at the iffy watching a, 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 an auteurist film because it's so slow. So I don't think slowness in itself is something I want to privilege as being the, the kind of ultimate cinematic marker of, of, of decolonial strategies. But slowness used in the, um, as argument, right, within a particular context, which is why Anamika Huxa's film, which is anti-slowness, <laughs> completely, is completely frenzied. It's also doing such powerful work. And there again, that temporality is, is different. If you mean by that slowness and decoloniality as a sense of how cinema can convey the duration of being, of dwelling, of inhabiting, right? That duration, I think, can be seen not only through slow, long takes, but also sometimes through montage editing, as we've seen uh, with the Anamika Huxer mode. So I think there are different techniques of, of, of working with time in cinema uh, that can do that, that kind of work of, of producing a sense of duration, which doesn't have to be about the, the long take. Thank you. Uh, the other has to do with uh, Aksar's film. Uh, in Ghore Ko Jalebi Khilane Le Ja Rahi Hu, I find the use of the tourist, the figure of the tourist guide very telling. Um, you know, Delhi as a tourist spot, and as he says, the many Delhis. Uh, you know, my interest is in the English that the tourist guide of the other Delhi speaks, as it were. So the adding of ing to Hindi words, something we've been doing in school or in Bangla or Hindi uh, for decades now. But I think this is a new kind of English. It's different from, you know, the hemoglobin of the atmosphere that we find, say, in my name is Antony Gonzalez. It's a kind of new English that has its relationship with power. And I noticed this for the first time in Pratik Vats's Eve Alley. I don't know whether I'm pronouncing it correct. I, I, you must have watched this film, right? I, I, I loved it. And because you mentioned the human, the pressure on this boy from the provinces who comes to Delhi, a city of obvious power, where English is a language of power and where he's supposed to speak in the language of monkeys to shoo them off. So, you know, the, the entry of the non-human language there. I'd like to know your thoughts on this. So there's so so much so many things right in in what you're asking and uh, again great examples of films I think that that we should all watch um, and many of them available actually online. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the the sequences with the, I was one I was debating whether to show one of those sequences today or not. I I chose instead to go with the dreams and and the visions part of it. Uh, but the film does a very, I mean, it's a very fierce kind of a critique of this new cultural form of the urban heritage walk, right, where there are attempts, right, to, to know your city and know those parts of the city that, 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 are, that seem unfamiliar. And I think what's interesting to think about there, given our current conversation of today, for me this morning, um, is precisely those ways in which ideas of diversity and the other uh, get instrumentalized and commercialized in ways that do nothing to alter structures of power or knowledge, right? So you can, you can pay, you know, 1,000 rupees, 2,000 rupees to a very consummate guide uh, who will give you access to the lives of others, right? Uh, which, and only so that you can return again uh, with a sense of, of uh, both having feel, felt good about what you've just uh, done, but also knowing that there is that comfort of home uh, to return to. And this is a very difficult thing to say because I'm also implicated, right, in, in, in part of that, that location as, as urban elite, right, in, in many, many ways and forms. 
But the film actually, for those that haven't seen it, complicates that even further. It even sh it shows us possibilities of ways in which that urban work can also transform that elite bourgeois self. But that's only when one of the, the pickpocket characters in the film uh, appropriates the walk and says, I'm going to do my own <laughs> kind of subaltern walk yeah. of Shah Jahanabad, <laughs> which is completely disorienting. And uh, many of the tourists say, we refuse to partake of this. Uh, but those that survive again to the end of the journey are able to, 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 to kind of inhabit for a temporary moment something. So there's just many levels at which um, uh, Anamika Haksar and the film doesn't spare anybody, including that subaltern subject who in one of the sequences, just after he's done his subaltern walk, um, encounters a female rag picker and is staring at her as if he's seeing, seeing something new for the first time in some way. And the woman immediately rebuffs him, right? thinking that this is obviously another kind of male predatory figure and showers a barrage of abuses on him. So many, many ways in which this, what is the relation between self and other uh, is being questioned in the film. Um, yeah, and I think the Eve Alehu example is, is obviously very, very pertinent. And it's the question of, again, the non-human animal right? Or the non-human thing, uh, or to think with, with trees and hills and rivers, um, and even uh, 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 local forest spirits, for example. What does that do? How, how can that help us think again about these questions um, outside of these kind of hierarchical boundaries, but more relationally? But yeah, I'm happy, I'm happy to chat more about these things. I also found uh, the casting very clever, you know, using the Mungeri Lal person as a dreamer, you know, after 25 or 30 years, the person we met on Durdarshan. We have two questions. The first is from Shreya. Can one question the very form of cinema as Western, if not colonized? The authority of the camera is really questioned. And in the context of the first film that was discussed, the gaze of the cinema expands to capture captured in quotes, the mm -hmm. realm of dreams of the marginalized. The entry of camera in India also has colonial origins and it was used primarily for police work and for documenting the natives. Mm -hmm. That's yes, Shreya's that's, question. That's a great question, right? And definitely uh, it's something I, I mentioned at the outset that the camera has been implicated in the projects of colonialism and ongoing coloniality um, from, from the outset until today. And there are many, many ways in which one, those of us that do kinds of histories of media forms and media technologies are able to recognize that some of the emergence of many of these forms was aided by their instrumental kind of use uh, in certain forms of policing, surveillance, and so on. And I'm doing some work on, on photography um, to, uh, to that um, on, on those lines. And cinema also uh, has been used as a mode of capture very, very um, directly. But the thing that I'm interested in thinking is uh, that how that to be able to historicize technology, right? And to be able to see its kind of implications within certain regimes of power and knowledge doesn't preclude us thinking about the other possibilities, again, of the camera. And again, if we think of the camera and, and the filmmaker and the subjects and the environment within which the camera is placed as relational, right? then we can see that there are possibilities for shifting valences of power between each of these actors within this kind of ecological field which is to say that the camera isn't, according to me, intrinsically colonialist. There is always something of the extractive, I do agree, in, in that moment of taking of the photograph. But, in, but there are many, many ways, I think, in which uh, some kind of um, really, I mean, sometimes deeply thought and sometimes perhaps not that deeply thought, spontaneous ways of encountering a field, an environment, another through the camera becomes useful. And I think here there was something I was thinking about actually um, 
earlier, which was about who are these filmmakers that are shooting uh, these films. And it's very important that Anamika Haksar actually places herself biographically within this film and within this milieu, right? And uh, there are many ways in which she, she kind of also makes herself present in the film and vulnerable in the film. This is a part of the city that, uh, that she has childhood ties with, but is, but is seeking to kind of revisit, reimagine um, anew. And to do that, she spent, I think, a few months, at least several months of uh, intense kind of workshops, discussions, conversations, just hangouts uh, with people who, who later agreed to share with her uh, some of the conversations that you see in, in the film. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think this is a question we have to always ask that from what position, what is the camera gaze kind of, uh, what work is it doing? Is it a work of capture? Is it a work of encounter? Is it a work of dialogue? Uh, and I think this, the same kind of camera techniques um, may not always mean the same thing in terms of, of what is the ethics of, of, that, of that view. I, we have three more questions and we are running short of time. Uh, let me read them all to you and you can probably find a way to answer them all. The first of these is from Paul Dave. Do your films suggest how we might acknowledge the humanness of the figures that they present, both inside the cinema hall and outside it? The next one is from Karthik Nair. Thanks for such a provocative and rich paper, Devoshri. I really appreciated the way you introduced us to the urgent intellectual project of decolonizing the human. I wanted to ask you about how there was what I thought an interesting tension between first the films and what you were arguing about them, that they are forms of knowledge production, exploring new ideas or even structures of feeling about the abject of spectral wealth. And second, the method by which you were making the argument, close analysis of style and narrative, including the use of clips, stills, which I think of as a cornerstone method of the, shall we say, unreformed humanities. It constitutes an observing, perceiving, and reporting human subject that doesn't seem so far from the enlightenment subject. I might be asking something long dealt with in the literature, so please forgive me. The question from Shreya I have asked. Yeah, I think these two. Thank you so much. I think these are such great questions, and they um, and um, I approach them in in the spirit of an ongoing conversation because I will not claim to be a master of these topics. It's something I'm trying to think through. Um, and the question I think Karthik you're asking is about how how do we how do we study? Like what is it that that is the work of the scholar? Right, so I'm I'm not I'm not a novelist, right? I don't make music, but I I study things, and one of my main sites of of study is is film. And is there a way you're asking that I might be able to to think with, right? So one of the for me studying film is to think with film, and you're asking, is there a way to think with film? Right, and then present that thought right in 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 a forum such as this, that is not replicating uh, those same forms of knowledge production. But I guess my interest is not so much in. Um, I mean, even us being here right on Zoom, <laughs> there, there are so many, or even just the format of the forty minute talk and and so on. My Zoom voice. These are all definitely implicated in certain kind of established forms and modes of the academy. But I think the question is something actually quite different, which is how to take seriously certain images and sounds, right, that are produced in, in, the, in the world of filmmaking and how to be able to do some kind of um, solidarity work with them, right? How can I approach these films uh, and be able to articulate what valuable work that they are doing uh, for this shared project of <laughs> kind of rethinking of coloniality. And in order to do that, I can't abandon these films and, and refuse to talk about them. That often does become a kind of a default that then one can, one can speak of nothing. One can look at nothing, 
right? One can only talk about the self. And again, the thing that I'm trying to ask and, and, and assert in this question of these uh, colonizing the human is that the very question of even turning inwards to the self is always already a question of the other. And the, that's why I started with the idea of knowing thyself, right? That it, this is not an escape, navel gazing or saying I can only ever turn the camera at myself. The only form of image production ever in the world can be the selfie, right? That cannot be the solution because there one is obfuscating the fact that this thing that I'm seeing is myself is continuous with all these other beings, right? That I'm feeling embarrassed to, to perhaps approach or think about or talk to or touch. So I think it's it's a little bit more complex um, than that, but I'm grateful for the question. Thank you. Two comments, such a fascinating session. Thank you, Professor Mukherjee by Mridula Sharma. And thank you, Devoshri, wonderful talk by Francesca Orsini. Uh, thank you, you Devoshri. Uh, I really enjoyed the session. And now I think this is, uh, uh, Professor Amit Chaudhary will take over from here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you, both of you. Thank you, Shumana, for wonderful moderation. Thank you, Devashree, for this lovely and uh, illuminating sort of approach and, and these amazing uh, films you talked about as well. Um, um, tomorrow, we are back at uh, five o'clock, and the first session is um, is a panel discussion. So all the other ones have been and will be talks, but the first one is a panel discussion on science. And, and then after that, we have Francesca Orsini uh, and we end with Amir Hussein. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to those three sessions tomorrow greatly. And I'm, I'm relieved that the first day went off uh, pretty well. I mean, notwithstanding my talk, but it, that it went off so well. Yeah. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Thank you and bye bye all of you. Bye. Sure. So I, I think stop the recording. <laughs>